and Government Activities and Transportation is called to order. The subject of this hearing is the transportation of hazardous materials by rail. This hearing is prompted by two disastrous toxic spills in California. People in California are justifiably frightened and angered by recent events. And people in most of the United States could easily have this happen in their towns, in their neighborhoods. This morning I heard of a derailment of an Amtrak train. I'm told anywhere from five to seven deaths. I don't have the exact number here. It seems that every day we're hearing about a horrifying accident by rail. And I hope that since many people say bad things happen in threes, that we'll have a rest from this. On July 14th, a Southern Pacific train derailed above the Sacramento River. A train car fell into the river, spilling 19,000 gallons of metamsodium, a pesticide. This pesticide flowed down the river for 45 miles, killing every living thing in the river along that stretch. The Sacramento River was one of the foremost trout fishing rivers in America. Now it is a virtual graveyard. When I was in California, I had a briefing given to me, and during that briefing, the State Department of Fish and Game was unable to answer when, if ever, life in that 45-mile stretch of river would be back. The Sacramento River runs into Shasta Lake, one of California's foremost vacation destinations. Tourism is being adversely affected. The spills toll over 100,000 trout and countless other fish, and there may be more, that's a conservative number. 200 people sent to hospitals for emergency treatment for skin and eye and respiratory ailments. Five people were treated for other ailments, including heart ailments. Business throughout the region hurt by the loss of vacation business. What bothers me most about this incident is that metam sodium was not labeled hazardous. It was not on the Department of Transportation's list that governs the Federal Railway Authorities list. Federal Rail Authorities within DOT, in my opinion, have abdicated their authority to determine if substances are hazardous to the environment and will list as hazardous to the environment only those materials designated by the Environmental Protection Agency. But the EPA looks at, at whether chemicals are hazardous, hazardous if used as intended, ignoring the issue of whether these chemicals are hazardous if spilled in transport. In short, it could well be that no one is minding the store, and the store is moving into a moving nightmare. Take a look at the map, please, that is up on this far wall. Between its starting point near Los Angeles, maybe, Tim, you want to go up sure. to the map. Between its starting point near Los Angeles and the point of the spill in Northern California, that ill-fated train crossed 141 bodies of water. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that EPA and DOT should consider the effects of these chemicals not only in a farmer's soil, but also in a river, a lake, a reservoir, a pond, a creek, a stream, an aqueduct. The failure of the Research and Special Projects Administration, known as RISPA, an organization within DOT, to label this chemical as hazardous strikes me as a gross dereliction of duty. I might note that the Coast Guard considers metamsodium hazardous for bulk shipments on water, and that farmers who purchase metamsodium receive information warning them that the chemical is toxic to fish. 
When we know that a chemical is traveling over water, wouldn't it be easy to check the Coast Guard list and add those hazardous items to RISPA's list? State investigators at the scene of the spill could not find out until the morning after the spill what deadly effects metamsodium would have had when released into the water. Had metamsodium been designated hazardous by federal authorities, more detailed information would have been available on board that train along with warning placards on the side of the car. Again, at the briefing that I had on the Sacramento River spill last week, I was told by a California-based EPA official, and I see him here today, that he believed EPA should consider listing all pesticides as hazardous on an interim basis. I believe that this would be a critical step in the right direction. Put the pesticides on the list and put the burden on the manufacturers to get their products taken off the list if, in fact, they can prove that they're not hazardous. I believe that RISPA should also accelerate the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking on tank car head shields, which can be added to the front and back of tank cars to greatly reduce their vulnerability in accidents. An advance notice was published in May of 1990. A final notice could be published within a month from today. While Californians were reeling from the Sacramento River spill, and our good friend, the Honorable Wally Herger, is, is going to give us more information on that, a second accident took place. On July 28th, a Southern Pacific train derailed in Seacliff, 75 miles from Los Angeles. This train spilled hydrazine, a highly toxic chemical. The results? Amtrak San Francisco to Los Angeles service was shut down as was US 101, and by the way, US 101 is still closed down, leaving many people to sleep in their cars. Residents of the town of Seacliff were evacuated from their homes and places of business. The hydrazine was labeled hazardous, but was carried in individual drums that are not as thick as the tank cars used to ship hazardous chemicals in bulk. In fact, these steel drums carrying this most corrosive poison were only three one-hundredths of an inch thick. As thick as this thin dime. This shipment method is legal. The question is, does it make sense? I say no. I was one of the motorists caught in the traffic jam, I actually call it a paralysis, that resulted from the sea cliff spill. And I had an opportunity to experience firsthand the anxiety that strikes you when you're trapped in a sea of cars because of a toxic cloud of undetermined effect and you feel the discomfort and wonder if it's the toxic fumes in the air or the air pollution from the thousands of cars. It made me ask myself, how many warnings do we need before we clean up our act? Do we have to see an entire town, an entire city wiped off the map? I hope not, but the most thoughtful, demanding set of regulations in the world would be worthless without teeth. The federal government needs to pursue a relentless program of enforcement and follow-up of shippers of hazardous materials. The subcommittee staff has been contacted by an anonymous whistleblower. This person's detailed knowledge of railroad regulation and inspection procedures has convinced us and believe me, we have turned away many such callers. This person has convinced us that he is a very credible source. This whistleblower informed us that Southern Pacific has had about a 90% failure rate of locomotives in recent surprise inspections. Documents that we got just moments before this hearing bear that out. The failure rate of SP's locomotives is significant because we have learned that problems with the locomotives may well have caused the July 14th derailment. Indeed, we are investigating whether one of the four locomotives on the train that derailed on July 14th was declared defective the day before it left on its fateful trip. Whether it was adequately repaired prior to pulling out of the station is something we are continuing to investigate. 
The subcommittee is trying to determine whether there has been leniency on the part of federal authorities toward Southern Pacific. Toward that end, I have written to the FRA requesting documentation of FRA inspections of Southern Pacific trains. And as I get into the questioning, I have some documents which bear this out. In addition to the specifics of SP's situation, the National Transportation Safety Board and the General Accounting Office have identified chronic flaws in FRA's approach to inspection and enforcement. We need to know what steps FRA is taking to put teeth into existing regulations. This subcommittee intends to see that appropriate steps are taken to protect the public from further toxic spills. Federal agencies must understand that they are obligated to protect not only against immediate threats to human life, but also against threats to our environment. I'm also very pleased that the Honorable Robert Lagomasino is here because he can give us his accounts of the Southern California situation. I have to tell you, I'm speaking for myself, the minimalist attitude manifested by the agencies in this area is completely unacceptable to me, and I hope that this hearing will shed light on these tragedies so that we can move forward and see that they do not repeat in the future. And before I call on our honorable uh, two witnesses who are seated in front, I will ask Mr. Cox, uh, the ranking member, the distinguished ranking member, if he has any opening comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. This hearing on the pesticides bill in the Sacramento River just over two weeks ago can be a very constructive step toward repairing the damage and preventing future such accidents. And I, too, welcome my colleagues, the Honorable Wally Herger, Herger and the yeah. Honorable Robert Lago Marcino, uh, who have been very energetic in pursuing remedies for these problems. Governor Wilson has rightly called this spill an unprecedented environmental disaster. As Congresswoman Boxer noted, the derailment of a rail car and the release of over 19,000 pounds of metamsodium into the Sacramento River destroyed virtually all plant and animal life along a 45-mile stretch of the river. Although the herbicide's plume has largely been contained or dispersed, the long-term effects of the spill to the aquatic ecosystems could be significant. One of the purposes of today's hearing is to inquire whether the federal government bears any of the responsibility for this spill and whether Congress has been part of the solution with the problem. Over the past 20 years, Congress has passed many statutes and the Department of Transportation has issued many regulations, literally thousands of pages, based on these statutes in order carefully to regulate the transportation of materials such as this. The purpose of these laws and regulations is to protect the public health and safety and to prevent exactly this type of accident. But of course, no law, no regulation, no enforcement and inspection, no matter how stringent, can prevent all accidents. We will hear today from the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Transportation, and the General Accounting Office about the steps that they feel can be taken so that materials that are actually hazardous come under proper and consistent scrutiny by our agencies. For example, this committee has been told that while saccharin is considered a hazardous material by DOT, metam sodium, whose effects on the environment are rather obvious, is not so classified. Particularly in light of the even more recent spill three days ago in Seacliff, California, that released into the air 440 gallons of hydrazine, which is classified as a hazardous material by DOT, it's important that we investigate how the implementation of lengthy and often confusing regulations is coordinated within the agencies. I'm looking forward to the testimony by our first distinguished mm -hmm. panel, uh, Wally Hergo and Bob Lago Marcino. I thank you both for attending. I know that my colleague, Congressman Frank Riggs, is also vitally interested in this matter, and he may be joining us later. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I think your comment on saccharin is important. This saccharin is listed on, as a hazardous material, and metam sodium that killed 45 a miles of a river isn't on the list, and somebody's got to explain that to us. Um, Mr. Lagomarsino, welcome, and, and please feel free to take as long as you will to get your statements into the record. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Cox, 
I thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify before you on the recent train derailment and hazardous material spill near Seacliff, California, in my district. And that accident, as well as the one that my friend Wally Herger will describe in the Sacramento River Canyon, has raised, as you've already pointed out, very troubling questions about the adequacy of federal regulations governing the transportation of hazardous materials by rail. Three days after the accident, Cleanup operations are still underway, although the uh, fire chief told me last night he thought they would perhaps be finished by last night, but I haven't <coughs> received confirmation of that yet. But the Pacific Coast Highway and the railroad track, of course, has not yet been opened, reopened. Fortunately, no one was uh, seriously injured, and although the local impact has been severe, we can be thankful the accident didn't occur 15 miles further back or 20 miles further on, where it would have been in downtown Ventura or downtown Santa Barbara. And from a personal uh, <clears throat> standpoint, I can say I'm glad it didn't happen, fortunately it didn't happen six miles back, because that's where I live, right next to the railroad track. For those members who are unfamiliar with those two cities, the Southern Pacific Railroad and US 101 go through down the downtown area in both cities, Ventura and Santa Barbara. And if the train had been derailed at either of those locations, thousands would have been forced to evacuate, and numerous injuries and extensive damages could have resulted. 14 cars of a 42 Southern Pacific train jumped the track Sunday afternoon at a point where the Pacific Coast Highway crosses over the rails. And there were 76 drums of a very toxic and volatile rocket fuel component, liquefied <laughs> hydrazine, which were on the cars which derailed. Many of these containers erupted, ruptured I should say, sending a cloud of toxic fumes into the air and about 500 gallons spilled onto the ground. In addition to causing nausea, burns, nerve damage, and damaged internal organs, hydrazine is extremely explosive. And that was one of the real problems here, and one of the reasons it was very difficult for federal investigators, for example, to get into the area, because the number one priority, of course, was to uh, remove the danger. I can't overestimate how dangerous of a substance hydrazine is and how fortunate we are that no serious injuries took place. As the uh, Madam Chairman pointed out, uh, local residents, about 300, were evacuated and the Ventura County Board of Supervisors uh, declared a local state of emergency. It severed Amtrak rail service as well as uh, freight service between Los Angeles and San Francisco, which is still uh, suspended. Hundreds of Amtrak passengers were stranded in Ventura and Point South, and the uh, US 101 was also uh, forced to be closed, not only because of the danger from the toxics, but uh, it was, I guess it still hasn't been determined whether the bridge was damaged when the uh, freight cars ran into it. Uh, as you know uh, full well, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, thousands of travelers were caught in a 10-mile traffic jam, and on a typical weekend day, 68,000 vehicles travel this highway between Santa Barbara and Ventura. And motors have been rerouted on to a 35-mile detour, which goes through the mountains, and it's uh, two-lane, bumper to bumper, uh, not very pleasant. It's pleasant in ordinary times, but not with that kind of a traffic jam. Once the accident occurred, the various county, state, and southern Pacific response teams reacted quickly and coordinated their efforts very well. As a matter of fact, the Ventura County Fire Chief told me last night and I quote him, he said it was the best run multidiscipline response effort he'd ever been involved in. Uh, because the Sea Cliff derailment involved chemicals which were listed as hazardous by the Department of Transportation, the rail cars were properly labeled, and more importantly, the engine crew carried manifests which identified the hazardous cargo on board. Another, uh, well, as a matter of fact, a fire engine was pulling out of the county fire station right there just as the Southern Pacific train jumps its tracks and collided with the underpass. And that station is just up the road from the derailment site, and the fire department was on the scene immediately. And the uh, manifest was presented to them uh, shortly after their arrival. So they were able to take the uh, precautions necessary to safeguard the public and emergency personnel. Had that not been the case, uh, even uh, we could have been witnessing a far more uh, severe result. Although local officials quickly learned that hydrazine was spilled at the site, the task of neutralizing and removing over a thousand gallons of extremely dangerous chemicals from the twisted wreckage of a rail car is no less daunting. It's uh, very difficult and very dangerous. I understand, for example, that in the neutralization of this hydrazine, 
uh, ammonia gas is produced, which is itself not exactly a, a, a harmless substance. So it's going to take time to uh, safely complete that. From what I have learned of this particular accident, at least preliminarily, the federal regulations requiring cargo manifests and rail car labels for DOT listed hazardous materials are critically important for emergency response teams to control hazardous materials um, and their spills once they occur. And apparently, they were, those requirements were fulfilled here. But the Sea Cliff derailment raises several serious questions about the adequacy of federal regulations governing the operating procedures and safety requirements of railroad shipping hazardous materials. And I would also uh, echo what you have said, uh, Madam Chairman. I think there are real questions about the method of shipping these, whether that is the proper way to do it especially in hindsight now that we know what can happen. Uh, originally, I understand that the fire department thought only a few, a relatively few of the uh, barrels that had been spilled were leaking. They subsequently determined, or at least uh, suspect, that all of them were damaged, or at least that they couldn't take the chance they weren't, so they all have to be removed. But in this case, the uh, train passed a detector designed to identify overheating journals and axles before they get too hot and produce an axle failure. The hot box detector located north of Ventura identified a warm journal on the Southern Pacific train, but the temperature apparently did not register high enough to trigger notification of the engine crew. Long before the train reached the next hot block detector, the journal overheated, the axle snapped and dragged along the track for several miles before the train actually derailed. At least 10 brush fires were set by the sparks from the dragging train parts between Ventura and the accident site. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the fire truck that I mentioned a moment ago was pulling out to uh, go to attend to one of those fires when the derailment happened. Numerous bystanders and motorists witnesses the sparks flying from the broken axle, and I believe at least one individual dialed 911 to report the derailment or to report the, uh, the incident. I believe it's clear that ample time elapsed between the breaking of the axle and the derailment of the train for the engineer to have averted the accident if he had been aware of the broken axle. Surprisingly enough, the devices which detect these events, such as hot box detectors and dragging equipment sensors, are not required by law, or at least that's my impression. So I hope this committee will take a close look at the safety regulations co governing railroads and ask itself why such devices are not required. This accident could have been prevented if the proper sensing devices had been in place at the appropriate locations along the track. So uh, thank you again for allowing me to, uh, to appear, and I'd be very happy, of course, to answer any questions that I might. Thank you very much, Congressman Larga Messino. Uh, we're also very pleased to have the distinguished um, member from the Napa area, Wally Herger, with us. We welcome you. We know that you've been intimately involved in the Sacramento spill, and we will give you as much time as you require to put your comments into the record. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Madam, Madam Chair. I, I am very pleased that your subcommittee is conducting this hearing on uh, both the Sea Cliff spill and the herbicide spill in the Sacramento River, uh, which, as you mentioned, is in my own congressional district in Northern California. I'd especially like to thank you, the uh, Chairwoman, and Congressman Cox for providing me the opportunity to join your subcommittee today. I had the opportunity to see the damaged area firsthand and to hear the concerns of the citizens who have been directly affected by this tragedy. This has correctly been called an unprecedented environmental disaster. Indeed, the derailment of the Southern Pacific Rail Car and the release of over 19,000 gallons of herbicide metamsodium into the Sacramento River has virtually destroyed all the plant and aquatic life along the 45-mile stretch of the river. This spill has not only been devastating to the Sacramento River, but to the people who depend on the river for their livelihood. The fishery has been a key draw for many of the thousands of visitors who go there every year and who contribute in the vicinity of $150 million annually to the local economy. The immediate effect of the spill on the fishery has been catastrophic. 100,000 fish are dead and surrounding wildlife may be threatened for many years to come. 
As part of our effort, I'm now forming a task force on the Contreras bill, which will bring together representatives of all the key federal, state, and local agencies with community residents, business, environmental groups, anglers, and experts versed in dealing with the hazardous materials to help make recommendations for changes in the regulations and federal law. And I'm looking forward with working with you and your committee as well, Madam Chair. It has been noted that while, excuse me, I hope that the Federal Railroad Administration can shed some light today on this tragedy and also touch upon the progress that has been made in safety and enforcement activities that there currently or will be, intend to be uh, practicing in the future. This is particularly important in light of the fact that we've just had a recent, just four days ago, mm -hmm. sea cliff uh, spill as well, which released some 440 gallons of hydrazine, which is classified as hazardous material by DOT into the air. Again, I thank you for holding this uh, committee, and I look forward to joining you uh, later. Thank you. I, I want to thank both of you. Uh, if, if Mr. Cox... Uh, do you have some questions? Oh, no, no. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cox and I would be very pleased if you would both like to join us up Mr. here. Can I yes. Uh, oh, no, no. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cox and I would be very pleased if you would both like to join us up Mr. here. Can yes, I, uh, please. I forgot to uh, mention one yes. thing, uh, Madam Chairman. I have a <clears throat> copy of a letter from uh, <clears throat> Rus Harold Rusty Fairley, a city councilman in Santa Barbara, to the city attorney of Santa Barbara relating to this matter and, and asking that he uh, look into uh, uh, whether or not it's feasible for cities to be notified of hazardous materials going through. I'd like to enter that in the record if I might. Without objection. And again, you're both welcome to join us for as long as you like. I, I would like to say to both of you that you've been very, very helpful here. I think the points that Mr. Lagarmacino raises about the fact that people saw a problem with this train, I don't know how many minutes before the derailment really occurred, mm -hmm. it seems unbelievable that the train proceeded. And, um, and Mr. Herger, I will be delighted to work with your, with your committee because I think as you dig deeper into what needs to be done in the future, it is this subcommittee, Mr. Cox and I will be happy to take your recommendations. So please join us if, if you can. Thank you very much. Uh, panel two is uh, John Anderson, Associate Director for Transportation Issues of the uh, GAO, the General Accounting Office. Um, I think it's important to note that the GAO has been uh, warning this country about the real possibility of these accidents, and I want to welcome all of you here. Mr. Anderson, why don't you proceed? All right. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Congressman. Uh, due to time constraints, I'd like to summarize my if statement. If you could speak closer into the microphone. And, and I need to ask if you would all stand and raise your right hand. It is the practice of the subcommittee to swear in all of our witnesses. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. You may consider yourself sworn. Mr. Anderson, speak closely into the microphone, if you will. Yes, ma'am. Uh, due to time constraints, I'll summarize my statement and request that the entire statement be entered into the record. With me today are Ron Wood, Debbie Justice, and Sarah Brandt. We appreciate the opportunity to testify on our work as it relates to the tragic California train derailment that spilled over 19,000 gallons of metam sodium, a weed killer and pesticide, into the Sacramento River. While much work needs to be completed before all questions about the accident can be answered, we can discuss what we have found thus far, recognizing that a lot of the information is preliminary. Speak up a little louder if you would. Please. Yes, ma'am. The actual cause of the accident will not be known for some time. What is known is that one locomotive and seven cars derailed, one loaded with metam sodium falling about 40 feet into the Sacramento River. There is a question about whether the train may have been underpowered for the region's terrain. The derailed train weighed 4,292 tons and did not have a separated pusher locomotive. Since the accident, Southern Pacific has changed its operating practice 
to limit train tonnage in this region to 3,200 tons. Transportation of hazardous materials is widespread. DOT estimates that there are approximately 500,000 movements occurring each day in the United States. From a safety perspective, DOT has responsibility for identifying materials that are hazardous in transportation. The HAZMAT Act provides the Secretary regulatory and enforcement authority for promoting a national safety program to protect against risks to life and property when transporting hazardous materials. The Secretary is required to regulate the transportation of any hazardous substance listed by EPA under the Superfund law, and he may identify materials as hazardous through other means. The Secretary has delegated regu regulatory responsibility to DOT's Research and Special Programs Administration, RISPA, for all transportation modes except for bulk transportation by uh, vessel, which is a Coast Guard responsibility. RISPA and the Coast Guard have developed separate regulations governing the definition and classification of hazardous materials, shipper and carrier transportation operations, and specifications for hazardous materials packaging and containers. These separate regulations cause metam sodium to be treated differently by both agencies. Metam sodium is not classified under the Superfund law as a hazardous substance. A possible reason for its absence from the Superfund list is that metam sodium is not persistent in the environment and therefore would not pose a long-term threat at a waste dump or at a, another uh, Superfund cleanup site. RISPA's acting administrator told us that RISPA regulates as hazardous materials only those hazardous substances on EPA Superfund list. Under the Superfund law, any substance designated as hazardous is automatically added to the Secretary's list of hazardous materials under the HAZMAT Act. In one sense, the Superfund law restricts the Secretary's discretion to regulate hazardous substances. He cannot take a Superfund designated item off of the DOT's list of hazardous materials. However, under our reading of the Superfund provision, the Secretary is not precluded from adding other materials to the list if he determines on the basis of other available information that they may pose an unreasonable risk to health and safety or property when transported in commerce. In contrast to RISPA, the Coast Guard has designated metam sodium a hazardous material for liquid bulk transportation. Coast Guard officials told us that metam sodium is the worst class of marine pollutants and is classified as a hazardous material primarily because it is highly toxic to marine life. One issue raised by the information available at this time concerns why two DOT agencies both operating under delegated authority from the Secretary to regulate transportation of hazardous materials, classify metam sodium differently. Its effects of spilled in water can be disastrous to marine life, regardless of whether the spill comes from a ship, train, or truck. As a result of the accident, concerns about FRA's safety role have been raised. We have conducted a number of reviews over the last few years relating to FRA's railroad inspection and enforcement programs. Inspection and enforcement are keys to safe railroad operations. We found weaknesses in FRA's railroad inspection and enforcement activities, and I'd like to point out FRA has agreed to make major improvements based on our recommendations. For example, we reported in 89 that FRA was not targeting high-risk railroad, uh, railroads and shippers for hazardous materials inspection, and that our FRA did not have enough inspectors. FRA increased its hazardous material inspector staff from 28 to 42, and revised its inspection procedures. Concerning the 1990 HAZMAT Act, both RISPA and FRA officials told us that they have initiated some actions to implement the act, but that their efforts have been hampered by a lack of funds. While a lack of funds may be a factor, RISPA and FRA management have some discretion in deciding on funding priorities. For example, RISPA has decided to delay a program to test hazardous materials containers so that funds could be used for other purposes. In summary, Madam Chair, all of the facts and circumstances on the cause or causes of the accident and the adequacy of the response will not be known until ongoing investigations are completed. However, the issue that two DOT agencies classify metam sodium differently should be promptly addressed. Overall, our work has shown that rail safety in general and hazardous materials inspections in particular have problems and FRA is working to improve the situation. While some actions have been taken to implement the Hazardous Materials Act of 90, much more needs to be done. 
This concludes my summary, and we'd be glad to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else have anything to add? Okay. You made some very key points, and I think the one that's, to me, a breakthrough is that the Coast Guard had this substance listed, and yet RISPA, which has, as I understand it, am I correct, the role and responsibility of listing the substances that should be deemed hazardous when carried by rail, did not put metamsodium on the list. Yes, ma'am, that's right. As I pointed out, we saw the train go over 140 or so bodies of water. Your reading of the law says to you that there is nothing that prevents RISPA from adding different substances to the list, even if they're not on EPA, EPA's list. Is that correct? That's correct. So it would be relatively simple, it seems to me, tell me if I'm right, and without cost, for RISPA to take the Coast Guard list and place those materials on its list when trains are passing over water. It Would seems that be to, easy? It seems like that should be a fairly easy uh, exercise to go through. In fact, I think something needs to be done immediately. Uh, we're concerned that there may be other materials besides metam sodium where there might be a discrepancy between the, uh, the two uh, agencies and how they treat them. That was essentially my next question. Have you looked at the list to see whether or not there were others that were on the Coast Guard list that were not on RISPA's list? We, we have not had a chance to do that yet. So you would say that it would be a relatively simple, easy, non-bureaucratic, straightforward mm -hmm. thing to do to put these Coast Guard materials onto uh, the RISPA list? I would think so, yes. If nothing else comes out of this hearing, I sure hope we get a letter this afternoon that that has been done. Have you looked at the, um, I know that GAO has been very involved in the inspection area. Have you also looked at the way these um, items are, are uh, placed on the trains? In other words, as I, as I mentioned, I held up a thin dime. It's actually, my understanding is that this, thickness of this would describe the uh, steel drums that the hydrazine that went through Mr. Lagermasino's district uh, were put in. And, uh, and I would pass that on for them to take a look at the thickness of the drums that the hy hydrazine, one of the most corrosive poisons known. And it's very hard for me to lift this, but this is really one of the weakest uh, thicknesses that we have for normal other kind of hazardous materials that go through. In other words, most of the hazardous materials are shipped in this thickness and the hydrogen, hydrazine, if I could have that back, what happened to it? It disappeared. <laughs> it was too thin. It was too thin, Mr. Lagerman. It was shipped in, in this. Um, I would pass that on for you to see. The difference between most of the poisons is shipped in tank cars like this. This was the hydrazine. So have you, has GAO taken a look at the shipping materials and I'm, have any comments on that part of this? I, I don't think that we've done any work in that regard. Our work over the last two years has focused on the inspection and enforcement activities of FRA primarily. And uh, since those are so key to improving and, and keeping railroads safe, that's that's what we've tried to focus our work on. Okay. The reason I raise this is um, FRA is all over the newspaper uh, in the LA Times absolving uh, Southern Pacific from uh, any responsibility uh, for what happened. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them these questions, but um, if it's true that Southern Pacific is perfect, and I have reason to believe it's not true, but if it's true, and, and the fact is we're allowing these corrosive poisons to be shipped in drums th this thickness, um, that's another area. But I will save those questions for um, NTSB and, and others. 
One of the issues in the Sacramento River spill is that the metam sodium uh, is not considered dangerous to human health, although I must say there were a couple of hundred people who went to the hospital, but thank goodness no deaths, uh, a few that had heart problems, but it, the threat to human health isn't as great as obviously the threat to the um, marine environment. Um, and I'm wondering whether you don't believe, in light of what happened in, in the Sacramento River, and my friend Wally Herger has explained very eloquently what has happened to the community because of it, if you don't think it would be worth expanding the list of substances to pesticides that may not pose significant dangers to human health in lower concentrations, but pose significant risks to the environment during accidents in, in transit. I think that that's something that needs to be looked into. Uh, I think immediately the agencies involved, EPA and the DOT agencies, need to get together and, and look into this whole area. In your testimony, you uh, say that the puncture from which the metam sodium flowed into the river was at the end of the car, not on the side. You also said that the DOT 111A tank car was not equipped with head shields or extra protection at either end of the car. If it had been equipped with head shields, would the spill have been uh, prevented or perhaps the magnitude of the spill reduced? I really don't know. I'm sorry I can't answer that question. Uh, the, the spill did come out of the end of the cars. I will point out that I think that th this uh, car, particular car, meets the uh, minimum standards for transportation of hazardous material. But there is a question, and I think one of the, uh, the studies called for by the uh, Hazmat Act of 90 uh, has uh, calls for a study looking at tank car design. So uh, whether or not it, uh, a better car would have prevented this or not, I don't know. I understand it's a pretty rugged terrain in that area, and the car did fall uh, 40 feet. So whether or not it could have survived that without any punctures, I don't know. Our, our understanding is it was about a 25-foot fall. Okay. Mr. Herger, is that your understanding that the that the car fell about 25 feet, is that? That is. Okay. okay. So you, you haven't looked at whether or not a head shield could have made any difference in this uh, case? Right. We okay. have not. GAO has repeatedly reported that FRA's staffing model cannot estimate the number of inspectors needed to effectively carry out FRA's safety mission. Um, are they making s progress in that area? And how long do you think it will take until FRA has an effective staffing model? Uh, I think they are making progress. I don't have any uh, current information. I can pass this to my colleagues. Do we have any? Uh, Sarah? Uh, in response to our report that came out last year, FRA is now um, trying to take safety data take information on where hazardous materials are being transported and put it all into a more comprehensive formula to ascertain where they can best use their limited supply of inspectors. What we found in our inspection work was that they were sort of randomly going out there and not targeting and through better targeting they can take the number of inspectors they have and make better use of them. So I think they're making some progress, although time will tell. You think they're making some progress. Now, in 1989, GAO stated that FRA lacks a systemic approach to its hazardous materials inspection programs. It said inspectors don't spend enough time evaluating shippers' safety procedures, that detailed information identifying high-risk shippers is not routinely given to inspectors for planning purposes, and that inspection locations are judgmentally selected by individual inspectors based on their experience. And what you're saying is, in response to this 1989 uh, report, and it is now, isn't it 1991, yes, that they're still uh, putting together some database to uh, come up with a better plan. Is that what you're telling me? They are, they have parts of the plan created and they have made progress in telling their inspectors to do some of those things that we recommended in 89 already. There are hazardous materials inspectors out there doing it that way rather than the random way already. We know that's happening, but how systemically it's happening yet. We haven't evaluated it again to see. Okay. 
GAO reported that FRA does not settle civil penalties issued for violations in a timely manner. At the end of 89, it took FRA 36 months to settle penalties, 16 months longer than in 1982. Nor did they collect more than 53 cents for every dollar assessed for penalties. Has this situation improved? I think the uh, situation, the latest information we have is that the backlog of civil penalty cases has improved. We made a suggestion that they might try to streamline the process, much like a uh, 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 traffic ticket type of system where the uh, FRA uh, regional offices could send the uh, violation notices directly to, uh, to the railroads or the shippers and only send them to the, uh, the legal counsel if, uh, if there were objections raised. And I think that they're interested in trying something like that, too, to streamline the process. The key, the, key, the key to any good inspection program is having a good enforcement program to back it up when you do find problems and with, with some teeth in it. And I think, uh, I think there's some improvement moving there. If it takes three years to settle a violation, do you think that acts as a deterrent? Uh, no, I don't. I think uh, you have to be better than that. And you have, you well, the penalties have to now? be firm. How fast are they moving now? Uh, I don't have any late uh, current information. We haven't followed up recently with them, uh, but that's one of the things that we will be doing. Okay, because I did ask if that you undertake another investigation. So I hope in that investigation we can find out what the time lapse is between the fining and the actual settlement, and whether it's still 53 cents on every dollar, and whether it's taking a long time. It, <coughs> Ms. Brandt, did you? I just might add that the FRA administrator has personally set a goal that he hopes to achieve within this, he set this goal last spring within like a one or two year time frame of one year from the time of violation to the actual payment of a fine. Now, how well they're doing on that, I can't tell we you. We will find out. I would say on study. the uh, level of fines, as in a percentage, uh, I have looked at the 1990 <coughs> settlements. Our study, we looked at 89, was the last year we looked at, and it appears to be the, the same 50 to 60 percent um, range is still existing in that area. So your, your cursory review shows they're collecting 50 cents on every dollar of the fine at this point still. Between 50 and 60 percent. Okay. The NTSB's May 1991 safety study on rail transportation of hazardous materials reports that the volume of hazardous materials shipped by rail increased 66 percent between 85 and 88. Have federal authorities and the chemical and rail industries taken appropriate precautions to keep pace with this increase? So this is a broad question. Uh, we haven't looked at this aspect, so I, I don't think I can answer that at this time. Uh, Ron, do you, we have any information on that? The only thing I can point out, probably the increase in the railroad has also been accompanied by a likewise increase in, in truck transportation that has this material as well. Which means that? means that there are probably m much more shipment of hazardous material across the nation, all modes of transportation day compared to what there was in 1986. So you're suggesting to the chair here that this is a broad problem? Yes, ma'am, I am. Where, because of this great increase, we, we ought to be looking at all modes of transportation of hazardous materials. Yes, I think about 70 percent of the shipments occur by, by truck and 30 percent by rail or other means, so. Well, more What's important to me is that's probably true, but the entire shipment has, <clears throat> has grown. Yes. And as I point out here, 66 percent of an increase between 85 and 88 alone. So the 70-30 is interesting, but the very important point is that we are seeing a tremendous increase. I want to ask you about Southern Pacific. Okay. Did you review uh, Southern Pacific Railroad's compliance records? Yes, I think as part of our uh, previous work, we've done that, and uh, I can let uh, Sarah, she did some of the detail work on that. I don't let her yeah, fill if, you in. If maybe, Ms. Brandt, if you could tell us what problem was Southern Pacific having with their locomotive compliance, and if you've looked at uh, this recent accident. Um, as far as SP's locomotive compliance is concerned, um, we, f we found that SP had I should preface, we can't really make a, uh, just because we did this previous work, we can't make a link to what happened. I understand. Here. Just for legal reasons, we don't know. No one knows what caused it yet. 
but SP, in the work we did, SP failed to inspect its own locomotives as required by Would FRA. Would you say that slower, please, and, and clearer? <laughs> SP failed to inspect its own locomotives as required by FRA regulations on a, con a recurring basis. Um, we found that FRA cited SP 146 times for this failure in 1989, and that's this failure with a civil penalty attached. This represented 16 percent of all these defects cited for U.S. railroads across the country in 19. Say that again. The 146 times represents 16 percent of all citations for this type of violation across the country on U.S. railroads in 1989. In February 1990, FRA conducted a special assessment of all SP locomotives in Tucson, Arizona and found about, now you say it's a little higher in some, another assessment, 75 percent to be out of compliance with FRA safety regulations. Now, I should preface this that the regulations related to safety compliance for locomotives have everything from there's too much oil on the floor of the cab to more serious things like the wheel is broken. But it's the responsibility of the railroad to make a daily locomotive inspection within a 24-hour period of, the, of each locomotive that's in use. And it's FRA coming in and saying that these inspections were not done properly is what this evidence is related mm -hmm. to. So in 1989, uh, Southern Pacific was cited 146 times for different violations, ranging from not so serious to serious. And when you say there's, in 1990 they were 75 percent out of compliance in their special assessments, are they, uh, those special assessments, as I understand it, are unannounced surprise inspections. Is that right. correct? FRA so takes a team of people, they come in and they look at every single locomotive. And mm -hmm. they tie up the yard until every locomotive meets all FRA state safety standards. I have, I have been told by a whistleblower, and this is, um, I have reason to believe the credibility of this individual, and I just wondered if you had any information about this. And I have some documentation this morning that may bear this out, that in recent months, a special assessment of Southern Pacific was called off right in the middle of that assessment. I, GAO have any information about that? I am not familiar with anything that's happened recently. We don't have any else on the panel? We don't have any information on that. Okay. What I'm going to do is submit to the GAO, uh, as you pursue your study, mm -hmm. some of the information that I have that may, may back that up. It would be helpful. But what we have learned here is rather shocking. Mm -hmm in terms of the failure rate uh, in these um, assessments. Uh, I don't have any more questions at this time. I'd be happy to ask my good friends and colleagues if they would like to ask some questions of the GAO at this time. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. The, uh, obviously, uh, you, weren't, you weren't asked when you were asked to come here today to comment on the uh, Sea Cliff accident because it probably hadn't even occurred yet. Do, do you have any information on that at all? Just no, we don't. Other than what we've uh, uh, read in the media, we haven't uh, looked at that at all. It, uh, it, regardless of that, uh, what, what you've testified about already does uh, pertain, at least in, in some fashion, to what uh, we think happened there. And I'd like to ask you about that. No, number one, you said that in what was it, 1989, there was a 16, or the Southern Pacific accounted for 16 percent of the uh, of the citations for violations. That was for locomotive safety inspection. Lo locomotive safety inspection. Uh, do you have any idea what percent of uh, of locomotives Southern Pacific has compared to the rest of the country? I can't tell you off the top of my head. But so. probably no. not 16 percent. I would say no. <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, and you mentioned the, uh, 
the uh, assessment where 75 percent of the uh, locomotives were found to be uh, in violation. Are there, do you have comparable figures for other railroads? Uh, FRA in Region 7, which is based out of San Francisco, has been doing a lot of special assessments on Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, on mm -hmm. Burlington Northern, on Union Pacific out there. I do not know what the results for those ones were, but okay, we they haven't just them. been doing them at okay. Southern Pacific. We can do it. The, uh, it seems like, at least in the Sea Cliff thing, there are two things that uh, are involved. One would be the question of uh, railroad operation itself, aside from what they were carrying. If the information that I related earlier is correct, and I have every reason to believe it is, it would seem that uh, a different kind or uh, more sensor devices could have prevented what happened there, and I suppose what happens uh, fairly often elsewhere. Uh, have you ever looked at that aspect of this uh, problem? I, I don't. GAO hasn't specifically done work on the detection devices mm -hmm. in the rails. Um, it's, there are special FRA people who look at those, and I'm sure AAR is involved with that also, but we have not looked at it. As I mentioned previously, the, uh, the six or seven reports that we've done in the last two years have focused primarily on the inspection and enforcement aspects in particular of, of the uh, FRA. All right. Well, I wonder if we could uh, ask that you, you take a look at that, and there would be, it would seem to me there would be two sensor things that uh, should be looked at. One is the uh, sensors that would detect a, a hot box, and, and I'd be primarily concerned, of course, in populated areas, in, in other areas out in the uh, middle of the Mojave Desert or something, it probably doesn't uh, reach that criticality. Mm -hmm. And the other one would be, uh, I understand that there are or could be devices that would uh, detect a broken axle, especially if it's dragging on the, on the rails or on the ground. And could you take a look at that also? We'll look at that. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Erger. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> uh, I, just to follow up on an earlier question, I understand that you mentioned that the Department of Transportation does have the authority to uh, list hazardous substance. Uh, yes. Is that correct? Yes. I, I guess my next question is, there, there's a concern on my mind of who's in charge here. It would sometimes seem that those who perhaps might have the expertise uh, the EPA, if you will, perhaps isn't in the position to tell the Department of Transportation uh, what to be doing here. And I, I have this concern of, of how we coordinate all this. I think that's a valid concern, and I think that clearly the... Uh, and, and just a moment, and I'm specifically interested if you have any, any specific recommendations on what we can do to have... Uh, some general coordination, and it's not just in this area, it's in every area in the, in the state. I, I, I was out there during this time, and we had, believe it or not, we got up to right at 50 state and federal and local agencies that were trying to work together on this spill up in Northern California that all had representatives, that all of them had to agree, each one had authority in a little bit different area. Actually, as complicated as that works, it, it, they were actually moving along much better than I thought they would have. But still, the thought of having 50 agencies out here, everyone has to coordinate with everyone before they can somehow come up with a decision is kind of mind-boggling. Do you have any specific recommendations on how we can uh, expedite this in a case of a tragedy that we just, the two that we just had? Well, I know the purpose of the 1990 Hazmat Act is to try to improve the uh, uh, inconsistency among different agencies and groups with regard to how hazardous materials are treated. Uh, I think if, if that were acted on, that would help. Immediately, though, the Department of Transportation has clear responsibility for the transportation of hazardous materials and how to go about regulating that. Now, the Secretary has chosen to delegate that authority to two agencies within uh, transportation, RISPA and the Coast Guard. One of the first things to do is that the Secretary of Transportation could get those two agencies communicating, and I think that there needs to be communication with EPA as well, given the pesticide situation. And that's what I would uh, say needs to be done first. Now, all the other agencies, state and local agencies that have to be uh, uh, consulted and coordinated with, that has to be done too. But it seems these actions can be taken, taken fairly uh, simply, it would seem to me. 
And do you feel the DOD has the expertise? Is, is, is this how they would gain the expertise by delegating it? Or do they have the expertise on hand to be able to determine? For example, in the case of the uh, metam sodium, we have a chemical spill in the Sacramento River that has the capacity to, to kill every single fish in a 45 mile run of this river, kill every insect, everything there, but yet for whatever reason, uh, whoever it is in authority did not deem that toxic enough to even put a label on the container indicating that this is toxic. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the middle of the night, a little before 10, uh, in a mountain canyon in very rural uh, northern California, very mountainous area, uh, we're a couple hours before we even determine that there's something in this car that's toxic. We, surely we can do a lot better than that in the future. It's hard for me to believe that we were in such a situation to begin with, but uh, I'm sure that the reason for this uh, subcommittee hearing is to determine, number one, what is, what is it that we did that we weren't doing right before, and number two, and more importantly, what can we do to correct it as soon as possible before we have another sea cliff? Well, gentlemen, yield to me on that certainly. point. Certainly. You know, I think that the GAO has already done us a service by pointing out that the Coast Guard list of hazardous materials could immediately be adopted uh, by RISPA so that we know uh, that if these materials are going over water, such as the case in your magnificent district there, and they spill, uh, we know immediately what they are and, and can move quicker. So. I think we at least have gotten to a point where perhaps all of us could join together immediately following and send a letter to RISPA um, as well as telling them today that that ought to be done without delay. And that would have really made a big difference. I'll give back to the gentleman. Again, I think, and of course there's a lot of other uh, questions. Even if we'd have known it was in the middle of the night, what could we have done in this particular spill? Uh, it was in the river, it was a fast moving river again in the middle of the night, even if we'd have known what it was, mm. uh, we can follow up with questions that I have for uh, later on the type of cars we should have and this type of thing. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Klug, would you like to uh, make any statements? I'll defer at this time. Okay, I just Mr. Can't. Zimmer, we welcome you as well. Question. We thank welcome you. you. Um, I, I have one more question for the panel. I was shocked to read GAO's June 1991 report examining the budget practices of RISPA for uh, fiscal year 90 and 91. The report and the information gathered by the Senate Appropriations Committee indicates that funds appropriated for programs, that is hazardous waste programs and the safe, safety of the movement of hazardous materials, that those funds were used instead for furniture and niceties like a public affairs consultant. I want to wait for these bells. So the, the Senate appropriators learned that the funds that this Congress put into the budget to expand this program of hazardous materials were used instead for furniture, niceties, a public affairs consultant. In fact, in 1990, RISPA spent five times the amount budgeted for equipment and furniture, and in 91, three and a half times the amount budgeted for furniture and equipment. This cut funding for hazardous materials container testing and enforcement, for assessment of the hazard of transporting certain materials and even cut back on printing additional copies of the emergency response guidebook, which as Mr. Herger pointed out, is so important when you have a spill. So somebody thought it was more important to sit in a fancy chair than to print up emergency response guidebooks and to move forward uh, with a program of safety that Congress in these tight budgetary times had in fact put into the budget. This seems to me an outrageous misuse of funds, given the problems uh, we are seeing and the increased shipment of hazardous waste materials that we know, as, as we pointed out, an increase of about 60 percent. 
I, I would like to ask uh, the GAO if they feel, because it was their report, that it was proper for RISPA to move around the funding in this fashion. It was perfectly within their legal authority to do that. And uh, it's a question of priorities that uh, I guess the RISPA administrator had to decide on. But mm -hmm. it was legal. Unless there's a specific language in the, uh, in the appropriation, uh, they have that authority. So what you're saying is, even though Congress appropriated funds for specific uses, there's no problem with an administrator using those funds to decorate his office. Unless there's some express language in the, in the appropriation law itself to preclude that. So I would say to my colleagues that we've got to take a look at our budgeting practices around here. I'm basically not asking you about legality. I, I mean, there's lots of things that are legal in this country that, are, that don't make any sense and don't seem to be particularly moral. I really think it, that would be an excellent question to ask, ask RISPA. I would not want to substitute my judgment for theirs at this time, though. Well, GAO did substitute its judgment and did point this out. We pointed out the information, the yes, ma'am. And I would say that um, the fact that those type of decisions can be made while we're increasing the movement of hazardous materials. Uh, is unbelievable to me. You know, one of the things that Congress gets criticized for on both sides of the aisle, depending on what the issue is, is getting into micromanagement. And believe me, none of us wants to. I don't want to, and, and certainly my colleagues don't want to. But when we learn that these things are done, when we help hearings and committees do their work, that this sort of thing happens, it makes us um, wonder whether we need to get more involved in the details of these of these budgets um, and and your point is had we gotten more detailed then they wouldn't have been able to move the money but because we weren't as detailed as maybe we should have been they were able to spend this money in other ways is that, that correct that's correct okay <coughs> I don't have any uh, further questions I, I want to now I, I really do want to welcome mr. Riggs uh, he, he, he has experienced um, the devastation of the Sacramento spill I want to welcome him to, uh, to the panel as well. And I want to thank the GAO. You've been very helpful to us. And I would ask panel three to come forward. Mr. Kolstad, chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, accompanied by Dr. Bernie Loeb, Office of uh, Research and Engineering. Gentlemen, if you have no objection, it is the uh, practice of the committee to swear in witnesses. If you would uh, raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear to testify that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. You may consider yourself sworn in. We welcome you. Uh, Mr. Kolstad, please proceed for as long as you need to Thank shed some much. light on this subject, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm pleased to be here today. If, if I could ask you to speak up, those mics aren't as good as they should be. Real, put it real close to you. Thank you. Okay. Pleased to appear before the, you and the committee today on behalf of the National Transportation Safety Board to discuss our mutual concern about the transportation of hazardous materials by rail. Before I begin, Madam Chair, if it would please the committee, I, I have... I still need you to speak louder. I'm uh, sorry. Okay. I have some details on the uh, accident that occurred in... Uh, Camden, South Carolina, this morning that you I would had very early. much appreciate if you would fill us in on that. Uh, to my colleagues, there's been a, another derailment, a very serious one that involved loss of life of an Amtrak train today. As of a few minutes ago, I'm told that we have uh, 13 fatalities. Oh my God! And 50 serious injuries as a result of uh, a derailment north of um, Columbia, South Carolina, near Camden. Apparently the last five cars of Amtrak's Train 82 from Miami to New York derailed. There were 426 passengers on board. We launched a team along with the uh, Federal Railroad Administration uh, some time ago, and that's, that's the extent of the details that I have at this time. We don't know anything about the cause no, at this point. Thank you. 
Each year, more than 1.5 million carloads of hazardous materials are transported by rail. If you connected these carloads together, you would have a train that would stretch from New York to Los Angeles and back twice. Mm. Between 1985 and 1989, there were nearly 15,000 rail accidents. 14% of those accidents involved trains that were carrying at least one of the more than 30,000 different kinds of hazardous materials regulated by the Department of Transportation. And of those accident trains carrying hazardous materials, 245 resulted in leaks or spills. But there's been a significant improvement since the 1970s when violent explosions and massive evacuations occurred all too frequently as a result of rail tank car derailments. One such improvement witnessed since the 1970s can be illustrated by looking at the 1989 CSX accident in Akron, Ohio. 21 cars derailed in that accident, including nine carrying 270,000 gallons of highly volatile butane. Because the cars were equipped with head shields, only two were punctured. Although there was a massive fire, no deaths occurred as a result of that accident. Although we've been fortunate that more accidents have not occurred, that's no guarantee that we will be as lucky in the future. Because of the high volume of hazardous materials moved by rail, the Safety Board believes more should be done to make its transportation by rail as safe as possible. Two rail accidents in which hazardous materials were leased occurred in just the last two and a half weeks. The Safety Board is investigating both accidents at this time. The first accident happened on July 14th when part of a 6,069 foot long Southern Pacific train derailed six miles north of Dunsmuir as it crossed the Sacramento River. Included among the cars that derailed and plunged 32 feet into the river was the car carrying metum sodium. This tank car suffered three separate punctures. One of approximately six inches by three inches was found on the side of the car, and two smaller ones were found in the top half of the A end of the car. About 15,000 gallons of the material, we believe, were released into the river. Upon contact with the water, the metum sodium became a highly toxic material. The second accident occurred just four days ago when 14 container cars derailed on another Southern Pacific train mm. under a freeway overpass in Seacliff, California. About 16 55-gallon drums of hydrazine hydrate destined to be used to clean boilers were punctured. The Safety Board has long been concerned about the transportation of hazardous materials in railroad tank cars that do not provide protection commensurate with the dangers posed by the products transported. For years, the Safety Board has recommended that shelf couplers, head shields, and thermal protection be required on tank cars carrying hazardous materials. We know that the added protection has contributed to a reduction in the frequency and severity of tank car failures. And that's why the Safety Board now recommends that other highly volatile or toxic materials be provided the same level of safety protection. The Safety Board believes that RISPA should identify potential problems and develop solutions prior to an accident rather than reacting to individual safety problems. Determining the degree of protection for tank cars transporting hazardous materials is most effectively accomplished, we believe, through a safety analysis that determines three things. First, the level of risks acceptable to the public, the level of risk from a release of a product, and finally, the protection needed to reduce the identified risks to an acceptable level. In December 1989, the Safety Board recommended that the Secretary of Transportation evaluate present safety standards for tank cars transporting hazardous materials by using safety analysis methods to identify the unacceptable levels of risk and the degree of risk from a, the release of a hazardous material, and then modify existing regulations to achieve an acceptable level of safety for each product tank car combination. Implementation of such a safety analysis process would allow RISPA to more systematically identify potential safety problems. We're pleased that Secretary Skinner agreed with this recommendation and that that RISPA has issued a contract to begin a risk analysis study. Ultimately, we're hopeful that RISPA will analyze all products 
transported in tank cars. This past May, we adopted a report entitled Transport Hazardous Materials by Rail that you cited earlier. The Safety Board conducted this most recent safety study to determine whether the recurring problems seen in the earlier accidents were continuing. As part of the study, we conducted investigations of 45 selected railroad accidents or incidents that occurred during a one-year period. The study noted that the inadequacy of the protection provided by DOT 111A tank cars for certain dangerous products has been evident for many years. Again, we expressed our concern about the lack of adequate protection for many dangerous materials being transported by rail. The study concluded that hazardous materials that are highly flammable or toxic or that pose a threat to health through contamination of the environment are frequently transported in tank cars that provide inadequate protection, even though better tank cars, better protected tank cars are available. The Safety Board also concluded that DOT 111A tank cars, which are frequently used to transport hazardous materials that pose a potential threat to public safety, have a high incidence of failure when involved in accidents. As a result of this study, the Safety Board asked RISPA to establish a working group composed of experts from government and the private sector to expeditiously improve the packaging of the most dangerous products, such as those that are highly flammable or toxic or pose a threat to health through contamination of the environment. This improved packaging could include head shields, thicker shells, and thermal protection. In issuing this recommendation, the Safety Board recognized that the safety analysis methods we had previously asked DOT to develop for identifying levels of risk posed by products and appropriate levels of safety provided by tank cars would take at least several years. Therefore, we have encouraged voluntary action by industry. Such voluntary action could be taken expeditiously and we think would offer an immediate improvement in safety. The Safety Board believes and hopes that this committee will agree that the, risks of trans that the risks associated with transporting products in tank cars must be identified, and then tank cars providing adequate levels of protection must be required. This means that primary and secondary hazards of materials must also be considered, and that products that pose a threat to health through contamination of the environment must be addressed as well. Madam Chair, that concludes my formal statement. I'll be more than happy to respond to any questions you and the committee may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Kolstad. Why would it take several years to ensure that better quality tank cars are used? Why would it take Why would it take several years? Because it would involve uh, a lengthy rulemaking process. And rulemakings tend to take uh, endless amounts of time. As but you they know. don't have to, do no, they? No, they don't have to. Because I have a really hard time in giving up on the ability of government to move when it should be moving. And it shouldn't take that long. Although I agree with you, they do tend to take that long. I'm involved with this subcommittee in trying to get a rulemaking move forward that would make it safer for people to exit from from exit doors at windows seats, if you know what I mean, in the yes, airplane. We've had horrible accidents because people got stuck and couldn't get out those exit at the windows. It's taking six, seven years for FAA to move this forward. And they've now promised the subcommittee it's going to be done when? Uh, by the spring. It took Britain a year, okay? So you have to wonder What's wrong with the bureaucracy here that we can't move a little quicker? I, I want to ask you a question. You've been critical of the 111A car and said that there are better ways. I have, um, is this the actual? It's a sample of the thickness of one of these cars. And you're saying we can do better. Um, here is what the uh, hydrazine was in. Uh, a, a steel drum with this thickness. And FRA has stated that that is in accordance with their rules. And this is one of the most poisonous corrosives known, hydrazine. Madam Chairman. So before, I, I have a question okay. for you. If you're critical of 
the A111, and I appreciate that criticism, and I'm going to take it to heart. What do you say about this, that hydrazine was put in these kind of drums, they were tied down into a car that wasn't even covered with anything substantial? Well, the first thing I would say is that it was hydrazine hydrate, which is not yes. hydrazine. Um, hydrazine is a form of rocket fuel. Hydrazine hydrate is quite a different chemical. I can't comment on whether or not that particular 55-gallon drum was an adequate container for that particular chemical or not, but I might point out that the drums were in another container that was similar to a uh, truck trailer that was then in turn resting on the flat car. But that wasn't anything that was particularly strong is my understanding. Well, that's one of the areas that we're looking into in the investigation is whether the containment of this product was adequate. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just... Uh, your suggestion of voluntary compliance, um, it, it, it sounds wonderful. I, I wish it could happen. But considering the number of citations that were issued to Southern Pacific over the years, uh, my information is it's, it's nearing 90 percent. The GAO says 75 percent failure rate in surprise inspections continually. And we have some documentation on it. If they're not even fixing up their problems that they have already, what makes you think that they're going to move to invest in these more expensive uh, tank cars in a voluntary fashion? Well, I don't know that they, that they will or won't. We're simply saying that while the rulemaking is, is underway, that an immediate and very quick solution to the problem would be for industry to step in and say, we're going to, on our own, begin replacing tank cars that are inadequate to carry the most dangerous products because of the exposure to the public. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I certainly will join with you in asking the industry to do that. I think it would be, uh, would restore some faith uh, in the public. Um, what I'd like to do is we have a vote now on the journal. So what I'm going to do is, uh, is temporarily suspend the hearing and come back after, after that vote. Okay. So if you would be kind enough to uh, wait around. Thank you very much. We stand adjourned for about 10-15 uh, minutes. The subcommittee will come to order and uh, thank you for your patience. Mr. Colsett, I'm going to ask Mr. Lagermasino to uh, ask some questions and, uh, and then I'll go to, or Mr. Herger, that's just fine. Go ahead, Congressman Herger. Uh, Madam Chairman, I, I just wanted to mention, I just have notice uh, from Governor Wilson's office that he has uh, requested designation for the two counties involved, Siskiyou and Shasta County, as disaster designations, which mm -hmm. will open up for Small Business Administration low interest loans. So I just wanted to make Thank you for that. that. Thank you. It just shows what <coughs> has come of this. Uh, this, this derailment. Yes, Mr. Lagermasino, please yeah, proceed. Th thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, a lot of the questions I was going to ask have already been answered, but I'd like to uh, go over some of them at least. Uh, sure. One, it, we're talking about the uh, Sea Cliff uh, incident, and I know that that just happened, so you don't have uh, all of the information. Matter of fact, I understand that up until perhaps right now, your investigators have not even been able to get to the actual derailment scene because of the hazardous materials that are still, still are or still were being cleaned up. Is that, is that correct? I think that uh, we are on scene, Congressman. You are now. Okay. Yes, sir. The, uh, but we did learn uh, from your organization earlier uh, several rather interesting things. Number one, that a hot box detector had detected a warm uh, transfer box, and that uh, later they found uh, presumably that transfer box uh, beside the rails, I'm, although I'm not quite sure where that happened, that there was apparently a broken axle that presumably came from the failure of that transfer box, and that that was dragging for at least uh, some miles, and that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that apparently, or the transfer box uh, heat itself, caused several uh, brush fires, up to 10 along the tracks. And I guess the question I have is, uh, number one, are there regulations relating to uh, transfer box heat, de or are there transfer box uh, detection devices required by regulation? I don't believe that they're required, Congressman. I, I think what happened in this particular instance was that the threshold uh, for the sensing device for the journals was... Uh, I said transfer, but it's a journal, actually. It's a, you're right. 
I believe that the it was just under the threshold that would have detected uh, that would have been detected and issued an alarm. That's what we understand. That, that it was that's uh, that's my understanding. Also, although uh, the the next question occurs then. Uh, are there enough of those along the track? Because obviously, at some point, it, uh, it exceeded the the, uh, the tolerance and did cause a problem, or at least so it appears at this point. Uh, now, I can I can understand why uh, such uh, sensors might not be required in the middle of the Mojave Desert, but going through uh, populated areas, I would think that uh, that's something we ought to take a very hard look at. And it seems. Uh, uh, from my layman's uh, viewpoint, also uh, quite incomprehensible that there wouldn't be some kind of a detection device required that would uh, detect when a car had actually fallen apart, as this one apparently did, with a dragging axle. Uh, to your knowledge, is there any uh, requirement or regulation concerning that? Not that I know of, Congressman, but I can tell you that uh, this is going to be one of the areas of the investigation. Because it, I mean, it seems fairly apparent to me, I might be wrong, sure. but uh, had they stopped the train uh, any time before the derailment, the accident uh, would not have occurred. The derailment would not have occurred. Perhaps the axle would have broken, but it probably would not have derailed the car. Uh, also, the, uh, the chairman pointed out the, uh, the thickness of the metal in the barrels that were uh, transporting this material. I, I assume that what she said is accurate. Is, is that your understanding, that that's the uh, gauge of the metal used in, in these... Uh, in these drums? I, I wasn't aware of the, uh, the gauge, Congressman, but I, I would certainly take her word. Uh, have, has your organization given any thought to uh, requiring uh, uh, thicker drums? I mean, most of your testimony was about uh, uh, tank cars, and I understand uh, why it would be, but uh, uh, this spill, of course, had nothing to do with a tank car. It had to do with uh, barrels that were spilled from a, uh, a container on a flatbed, as I understand it. Well, we've had, a, we've had an awful lot of experience with containers. Um, and in some rare instances, we have made recommendations involving specific uh, products. But on a, on a much broader basis, of course, we think that what RISPA needs to do is to take a look at the thousands of chemicals that exist and do this analysis that I mentioned earlier in determining what kinds of hazards they pose in themselves, what kinds of hazards they pose when combined with air or water, mm -hmm. and what kind of level of risk the public might be willing to accept. And I think that the committee might have been confused in terms of the amount of time that we were talking about this five years. That's all part of the process. The, the rulemaking process would be involved in making changes to the uh, tank cars. But this analysis that we're talking about of these thousands of chemicals and classifying them is going to be a very time-consuming process. Years. Yeah, I understand that, but I also uh, understand, and well, I know that in this case there was no question about that. It was, uh, was classified as a uh, hazardous material. It was so labeled. And fortunately so, because had it uh, not been so, there could have been some uh, mm -hmm. serious injuries or, and or deaths uh, that did occur. But that didn't happen because the, uh, the firemen on the scene knew exactly what it was. They knew what to do about it, and uh, to the best of their ability, uh, they did handle it. But, uh, but that still doesn't answer the question of whether it was properly packaged. But that, right, that's one of the things that you're looking absolutely. at. Absolutely. I would... Uh, we talked about you and the uh, the chairman discussed the question of voluntary uh, upgrading. Uh, I would I would guess one of the uh, concerns the, anybody who was a subject of that or thinking about it would raise would be how do we know that uh, even if we go ahead with a very expensive uh, modification, rebuilding cars, uh, the shipper doing different containers and so on, that that will be what is adopted as the rule later might have to do it all over again. How, how, do you, uh, how would you answer that? Well, I would answer it in this way. When you have a product like chlorine, for example, that if, if released in, a, in re a major amount would involve the evacuation of thousands and thousands of right. people. We've had one of those in the past 25 years that occurred in Florida and killed eight people and killed every farm animal in a large area and eight people waiting at a grade crossing. Mm -hmm. We're very concerned about 
cars that carry chlorine, for example, that they do not have head shields. There's no requirement for head shields on mm -hmm. these cars of 18,500 gallons or less. We think that those cars need to have head shields, and we think that shippers of chlorine uh, should demand that those cars be head shield uh, equipped. I would, That's I one would, example. Yeah, I would think so too. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Thank you very much. We've been primarily talking uh, throughout this hearing on, on the problems we've had with the chemical spills we've had, the herbicide up in, in, in my area. Uh, the fact is we live in a society today where our industrial nation runs on chemicals. Certainly the agricultural area that I represent is very much dependent on using chemicals in a safe and measured way. Uh, my question is, what would have happened, say, if we had had a carload of salt, for example, that had spilled into the river? Or, uh, say, a, uh, a detergent, which was the case. We know what happened a few years in the same location that happened on the Sacramento River. Uh, any comment on that? I guess I'm getting to the point is there's a lot more than just these chemicals we need to be concerned about. There's many items that we transport by rail or by, by uh, truck, which is far more, as was mentioned earlier, going up and down our, our interstate highways and on our tracks that really I believe we need to be looking at. No question uh, about it. And that we need to be taking steps on. What I would hate to see happen would be number one, we are effective after this, which I'm hopeful we will be on getting the cars marked that should be marked. And I think it's very clearly they are not at this time. Hopefully getting the, them reinforced to the point where we don't have this problem on, on the chemical part. But what about some of these other items that many times we don't consider as being quite as hazardous, but yet can destroy our rivers and our environment almost to as great a degree. Well, that's and why how, are you, how are we addressing <clears throat> that? Well, that's why I mentioned in my testimony, Congressman, that we think that ultimately RISPA should look at all products that are carried in tank cars to determine what levels of risk might be posed in the event of a major spill. Well, we agree with you. And you did mention earlier on the, uh, that we were doing a study that was that DOD agreed to make any idea when that study or the results of that should be out? No, sir, I don't. I think the contract was just led here recently, and I, that would be a question for RISPA. I, I just don't know, sir. And then in a little bit different area, uh, we heard earlier in testimony that we had had different locomotives that were not standing up, that were not being checked, that perhaps we were having a problem on, on ensuring that our equipment on our rails was uh, up to standard. A question I might have, there was some thought about whether a pusher locomotive, one that was on a steep incline as we were involved in, in on the Sacramento uh, River Canyon there, if, if I push your car, even though I know regulations normally, they were under the weight limit that normally would allow for that, uh, perhaps should this be a safety and would that perhaps have prevented this particular disaster on the Sacramento River where they were, had there been a pusher locomotive on this we, particular train? Well, we certainly don't know that at this point, but I can tell you that the operation of the train in all aspects uh, is one of the issues in the accident. So the whole issue of whether or not there should have been additional power at some other location in the train will be uh, part of the investigation. And again, any ballpark idea of when we'll have some uh, information and some uh, thoughts back on this, conclusions on, on this? Well, conclusions are going to be um, many months off, Congressman. Uh, these kinds of accidents, unfortunately, take a long time. Um, the way the safety board operates, we gather all the facts, analyze them, and only then do we do we make our conclusions? And while we're speeding up the amount of time it takes, I think we're probably looking, uh, not knowing the complexities specifically of this accident, I think we're looking at probably at least eight months. 
Okay, and then finally, the big concern that, that I have is we've seen already just four days ago another accident in another area in, the same, in our same state of California. Is there anything that we might, that you might be suggesting that we do in the interim uh, that might prevent maybe a few weeks from now or another month from now prior to this that we might be doing that we're not doing now? Well, I don't know if this is an issue in either of these accidents, but I think that one thing that we have noticed uh, in other accidents is the need for communities, uh, crash fire response units, to become familiar with the, the array of chemicals that are being carried on the nation's highways and rails so that they're able to respond in a comprehensive and effective way. Sometimes when these accidents occur, either, whether it's on the highways or whether it's uh, a rail accident, there is a period of inaction because of nobody knowing what to do. And we've made some progress in the labeling of hazardous materials, significant progress. But there is a level of, uh, of ignorance out there, simply not knowing how to extinguish a fire that involves a hazardous material, what kind of chemical to put on it to neutralize it. And I think that um, if, if there are communities that are located on a main rail line that uh, certainly those crash fire rescue units uh, would be well advised to uh, to do their homework and i th we have asked the railroad industry to work with these communities on a mutual response effort just finally uh this is not something new for our area as you're aware there's been <clears throat> over the years a number of derailments within a five mile section of track just in this area. It is very difficult. I understand different varying reasons for the different uh, problems, but hopefully when we're f out of this, we will have a better outcome than we've had in the past when we've had spills. And again, in this same area, we had a detergent spill which killed fish a few years before this. Uh, we have to ensure that we're taking the steps to ensure that this type of disaster does not happen again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kolstad, I'm a little disappointed in your answer to Mr. Herger when he says, what can we do in the interim? And you say, well, we have to work with, we have to teach the local people how to respond to a spill. Now that answer says to me that, that you're putting the stress on response after the fact. What we're talking about here is how to avoid this from happening. So I would like to push you a little further, perhaps, on what other things we could do besides get people prepared for the worst thing that's happening in their communities, and besides beg the railroads to do something on their own because it takes too long for a government to act. I don't accept that. Well, I think And, and I, I just want to be more sure. specific. Mm -hmm. One suggestion that has come up uh, here from the GAO is that immediately RISPA put on the list of hazardous materials, the Coast Guard list, understanding that a lot of these uh, trips are made over bodies of water. Would you concur with that? Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know the complexities of, uh, of what goes into the Coast Guard classification on products that move over uh, It's products water that if they mix with the water would be hazardous to the environment right, but and to the people. The marine carriage of a hazardous material may be entirely different than one that moves by uh, rail or highway. And I don't think I would be willing to, to okay. automatically say that we should accept the Coast Guard classification as being the correct one. Okay, so where GAO suggests that you take no position on that particular recommendation. Right. How about your own recommendation? of the National Transportation Safety Board in May of 1991, in which you complain that the rulemaking on hazardous materials takes too long, and quote, that in the interim, many hazardous materials that pose severe threats to public safety will continue to be transported in tank cars with inadequate protection, unquote. This is your own body. We agree. May of nine. okay. Absolutely. You agree with that statement. You haven't backed off. But yet, in the questioning, when asked what we can do in the interim basis, your only answer is let's train the well, local people. Well, no, that's people. not my only answer. Well, it was, Madam. sir. I mean, 
it was a very open-ended question. Well, I thought he said, is there anything else we can do? And that's one thing that we had not addressed. Okay, We've well, issued many recommendations what we can, what we on the issue of hazardous here. materials, going all the way back to 1981. Well, and I'm asking you now for the record, because some people may not be familiar with it, to tell us the things we can do in the interim, uh, perhaps to repeat some of the things that the NTSB has suggested in very simple terms. The reason is we want to help you. We want to move on those things. For example, um, in the report, in that same report, you recommended that immediate action be taken to identify the most harmful materials and have them uh, transported in stronger tank cars. Correct. Now, one way to do that is to adopt, in an interim way, the Coast Guard list. Another way is to put all pesticides uh, on a list and leave it up to the manufacturer to get it off. Uh, the other issue that you talked about uh, that was very important um, is stronger tank cars. You recommended in that report immediate action be taken to have these materials transported in stronger tank cars. So I guess what I'm trying to do now is, because I'm a person that likes to make things better, not leave here and not know what to do, mm -hmm. is to get you to specifically state uh, what you think we ought to do after these two accidents. See, I can't help but feel uh, that we have been lucky that no individual died as a result of these spills uh, directly. Uh, a river died, I think you could say that, 45 miles of a river's dead. No individual that we know of at this stage has died. So I don't think the next time we're going to be lucky. And I don't want to have us to come back here, here in California or in another part of the country. So tell me what you would do if you were us putting into your mind all of the past very important recommendations by NTSB, what we can do immediately. Uh, Dr. Loeb has asked me if he could respond to that. Please, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'd like to <coughs> put a couple of things in perspective. First of all, if this material was classified as a hazardous material under the DOT regulations, in all likelihood, it would have been shipped in a DOT 111A tank car. Right. That is a tank car that is designed um, under the specifications and standards uh, that permit hazardous materials to be shipped in it. There is another classification of tank cars uh, the, that are known generally as pressure tank cars, DOT 105s, DOT 112s, and 114s. There are not very many of those kinds of tank cars um, that are out there in industry now relative to the DOT 111A. The safety board did not take the position in its recent safety study that DOT 111A tank cars are per se unsafe for hazardous materials. We believe, in fact, they are very safe for, for many of the materials that are on the list. Uh, the problem is that some materials require greater protection, such as head shields, thermal jackets, um, the possibility of thicker um, shells, which the pressure tank cars have. Um, one of the dilemmas is if, if immediately RESPA were to declare all materials to be, so, uh, the uh, pesticides, insecticides, a uh, number of products like this to be so dangerous that they had to be shipped in DOT 105s or DOT uh, 112, 114s, or even 111s with head shields and, and thermal protection, industry would grind to a halt rapidly because there's not enough tank cars out there. Now, what needs to be done in the long term, and I'll get to the short term, in the long term is exactly um, what we have asked um, RESPA to do in terms of classifying, of developing this process to classify the risks associated with all of these materials, everything that's shipped by rail uh, tank car classify the risks associated with all of them, determine the risks that, that the public is willing to accept, and then determine how to package them so that the risks that they pose once they're packaged is in an acceptable level. Now, that's going to take years to do because there's going to be a lot of research that needs to be done. There's a lot of coordination between the various agencies. Um, in the interim, what we have asked is for this sort of voluntary program. I don't a sort think of voluntary that, that, program. That's exactly right. That is, that is exactly right. It, it's uh, it's a, a program in which we've asked the Chemical Manufacturers Association, the AAR, the FRA, the RESPA, um, and other organizations to per participate in, a, in an effort to determine right now, very quickly, which can be done, 
those, those products that pose a substantial risk when they are uh, shipped in a DOT 111A and therefore get them into a better protected car or to improve the protection on the 111s and make them uh, a, not a 111A but pe put head shields and uh, thermal protection on them. Uh, that's what we think needs to be done now. Um, if we were to ask for that to be done in a regulatory manner right now, the rest, and, and in fact, the DOT would have very little it could do. We've already asked them to take this longer term uh, uh, process, which we think needs to be done, probably should have been done 10 years ago, but it needs to be done now. And they would, th there would be little they can do. So I think we've taken the most effective approach that the, uh, that the NTSB can do. Which is to recommend a sort of voluntary program. Madam Chairman, no, you know, I, that's really part of this investigation. This. If I could just follow up. Look, I'm reading your own report here. Here it is. This is it. Yes, right, so it was, here's it right what here. you said. The DOT 111A tank cars often have been unable to withstand the forces of an accident, right. even when the train was traveling at slow speeds. That's correct. Okay. And it seems to me you said if you add head shields and thermal jackets, that might make things better. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. What is stopping you from suggesting that that rulemaking be speeded up? We could certainly do that. I mean, it, you have been up front here and leading the way for rail safety. And today all we're hearing is, gee, it's years. I can well, assure you the next accident, we, we won't want to come back here and do this again. So we need to have you lead the way here and not just say we're going to leave it up to the private sector. I can tell you, I asked SP, who came before me in a briefing, an informal briefing in Sacramento, about what it would mean for them to move forward and use uh, better cars to carry things that even aren't on the list. And they said, oh, it's too expensive. Oh, it's too expensive. We, w our people, we won't get any business people will, will, will not use the rails. Now maybe this is so, but then maybe we need to help. Maybe there's a way that we need to help the railroads in some fashion with some relief in order to do this, but I am just getting the sense that even after two serious accidents, we're not, um, we're not giving confidence to the public. I. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable with it. I used to be in local government. Uh, uh, Congressman Condon, I almost said Supervisor Condon, was a supervisor. Uh, many of us come out of local government and to say, gee, the important thing is that the local people know what to do when there's a spill. Yes, you're right, of course, but that cannot be uh, the only thing that comes out of this hearing. Um, so, so let me summarize where you are so that I don't misstate where you are. I want, because. I, Maybe we won't agree, well, but I, I want to make sure I, think, I know Madam where you Chairman, are. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Colston. I think you're missing a key part of it. And the Please key part of it is in. that we need to find out what happened in both of these accidents. If it appears that, we, that there is an emergency recommendation that is needed, we'll yeah, make right. one immediately. In eight months? No, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, because Whenever. you said that you Today. wouldn't finish the investigation for eight months. That's before. true. In, as the investigation proceeds, when we find issues that we think need to be addressed immediately, then we issue recommendations Good. immediately. We issued a recommendation in the course of the investigation of the law to air accident. We issued many recommendations in the course of the DC-10 accident in, uh, that occurred in Excuse Iowa. We do this as a matter of course. That might occur in either or both of these accidents. I don't know because the accidents investigations are underway. But until we find out what happened in these accidents, we can't very well sit here and say, well, we need to do X, Y, and Z with any precision. But we will be able to. We'll be able to say with quite a bit of precision exactly what we think should be done to prevent these kinds of accidents. Okay, that's very good. We do know certain things. We know that metamsodium was not on the list that's of correct. hazardous materials. And you don't have to study something for eight months to know that when a product kills 45 miles of a river, it's a hazard. I mean, I think we know that. We do know that. Okay. But that wouldn't so, have made any difference in this accident to have known that it was a hazardous I'm, material. I'm talking about what to do to prevent the next one. And to make sure, I can assure you, 
that according to SP, if it had been listed, SP told me the following, it would have been packaged differently and they don't know if it would have survived the 25 foot fall, that jury's out on that. It would have been placed in a different part of the car. That's in the testimony by SP. They would have put that car in a different place on the train. And it would have been labeled and the good local people would have known what they were dealing with. So to say it wouldn't have made any difference is false. Well, it would have made a big that. difference. We know that. I know that. I held a hearing and found it out from the people in the community and from SP. No, what I'm SP saying. said they right. would have treated the product differently. How can you sit there and say they wouldn't have? If they wouldn't have, what's the point of having any kind of rules and regulations governing hazardous waste? What I'm saying is I don't know that those actions would have prevented this accident from taking place. The jury is out on that. Correct. But we certainly know the product would have been treated differently. And we certainly can take action immediately to at least incorporate the Coast Guard list of hazards into RISPA's list, it seems to me. We also know that you, in your very own report, actually predicted these things, actually said in the most unequivocal terms that the cars they're using aren't strong enough. So we know we need to move forward. And your recommendation today, until you know more, is that this be done on a sort of voluntary basis. I have a real problem with that. I'm going to call on um, Mr. Condit for some questions. First of all, let me just uh, commend the chairman for holding this hearing. Um, you have done an excellent job uh, since uh, taking the chairmanship of this committee, and you seem to be in the right places at the right time. I have a quick question for Mr. Kolstad. I'd like to give you a little different scenario. Uh, I don't know whether or not um, uh, how much prevention um, this, the board gets into, but in California, it is not unusual for uh, trains to run through the middle of communities. Uh, for example, in the community of Modesto in Stanislaus County, we have uh, a train that runs down 9th Street several times a day presenting some uh, safety problems. And uh, we have been working on this for over 20 years to try to get an agreement between uh, SP and UP so that we could remove those trains from running down the middle of communities. Uh, the traffic safety problems, uh, no, no telling what they're carrying on the trains. Uh, it seems to me that if uh, we would get some assistance from the board in pushing people to come to an agreement, it would be uh, preventive. We've had accidents uh, with the tracks where people have been injured. Uh, we've had people who have had car accidents running into the train, and we've been fortunate not to have any cars turn over. But I, I guess what I'm asking you is, um, seems to me we ought to be focusing on preventing these kinds of things from happening. And in this case, we're a uh, scenario where I've described these trains moving down the middle of communities where a lot of communities are trying to move them away from uh, a high density popu population. Are you assisting them in any way or uh, taking a position or making recommendations or trying to press the, the railroad companies to, uh, to work with the local communities to do that? We certainly are, Congressman. And let me just say that uh, the focus of the board's work is prevention. It's uh, the, the fruit of our efforts are the recommendations, and the recommendations are specifically focused on preventing the same kind of accident from occurring again. We also engage in, in a limited number of safety studies, and uh, we make recommendations from that as well. Well, then why has it taken us over 20 years, you know, to come to I mean, I, I understand we're negotiating with the private sector. I, I, I totally understand that. But we've been sort of hanging out there by ourselves with the, the local city and, and uh, the congressman from that district working on this problem for over 20 years. Now, I've only been here a couple of years, and uh, we've held meetings every few months to try to get the two sides to negotiate an agreement. But we've got no assistance from uh, anyone outside that group that I've just mentioned uh, uh, why has it taken 20 years? And we clearly have a safety problem with these trains running down the middle of communities. Well, I don't know why it's taken 20 years. I can tell you, Congressman, that, um, that we have made substantial progress. It, it, it tends to fall on deaf ears, of course, when you're, you're the direct victims of, a, of an accident that has occurred in your own community. Uh, but there has been substantial progress made in, in tank car safety. And um, we think that we've got a long way to go. 
not just tank car safety, but rail safety. But um, I think we've come a long way. Do you, uh, uh, this is my final question, do you lack uh, the authority to push the railroad companies in some way to come to some agreement so they can mitigate the, uh, the safety problems where well, they're we, putting a lot of people at risk? We don't have any specific regulatory power, Congressman. Um, our sole power comes in our recommendations, and they're just those. Um, I think we have been uh, fairly effective in getting implementation of these recommendations on, a, on an overall basis. We're running about 77% uh, with the Federal Railroad Administration, for example, which is, which is fairly high. Um, if there are some specific thoughts that you have in mind that, um, that you want to see us undertake, uh, I'd be happy to entertain them. Okay, we, we will follow up with that. I appreciate it. Okay, sir. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Riggs. Madam Chair, thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to thank you uh, uh, on holding these hearings. I think they're very timely and important. I um, also want to thank you for the courtesy of being able to join you today. And as my good friend and neighbor to the east, uh, Mr. Herger will attest, uh, I'm here today because I'm downstream from him. Uh, that occasionally puts us at odds, despite the fact that we're, we're wonderful friends. Um, and all I have to say really, I guess, in this instance is uh, f thank the good Lord for the Shasta Dam in terms of its role in containing the, uh, the uh, uh, contamination plume. Um, but in all seriousness, I, I, I guess w part of the, the thrust of this morning's testimony as I've been able to pick it up coming and going is falls under the heading, I guess, of stuff happens. Um, but unfortunately, as I look into this more, um, I, I think that, uh, as Wally was alluding, that there's a real history of derailments uh, up in this part of California. Do you know the precise number and over what sort of time period we're talking about in terms of derailments in this on, area? On that specific line, Congressman? Yes. No, sir, I don't. If the general will yield, I have that information. It's been 20 derailments in a three-mile area since 1975. Thank you. I appreciate the Chair's information. Uh, I think also that... Uh, in, in this case, we're talking about a rail line in very close uh, proximity to, obviously, uh, a river with, with uh, substantial in-stream flows, a very significant riparian corridor, they had very much damaged by this latest spill. I'm, I'm wondering, though, as your investigation proceeds, whether you've been able to uh, look at the emergency response. You implied it was a mutual aid situation where more than one governmental agency was, was involved. Are you satisfied? with what you know so far about the promptness of that response? I have only heard bits and pieces, Congressman, about uh, the length of time that, that was involved. Um, on the surface, one might not be pleased, but uh, I don't know that we have all the facts. And I would, I would hesitate to be critical until uh, till I have more of the details of Well, why. would it be fair to suggest that the lack of information regarding the tanker car's contents contributed to a delayed response? We don't know yet. We just don't know yet, sir. You do not know yet? No, sir. Okay. Um, I'm also wondering, according to the GAO report, um, apparently, uh, I guess the on-the-scene uh, 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 agency personnel or the on-the-scene uh, folks that responded put in a, a call to uh, a um, chemical industry hotline to get further information? Chemtrek, yes, sir. I'm familiar is, with is it. That a, uh, is that a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week yes, hotline sir. service? Yes, sir, it is. With a human being on the other end? Correct. Live voice? Yes, sir. Um, and that is a, a very much an up-to-date database with respect to the toxic properties of, of hazardous materials and chemicals we, Our experience has been that it is, yes, sir. That it is. Would there be any, uh, any um, feasibility to considering um, requiring um, railroad companies, particularly ones that run these large freight rail services, to file, or maybe they even do now, but to file some sort of log regarding the um, trains contents with a central depository that could be accessed by phone on a 24-hour day basis? Well, I think you're talking about an extremely massive administrative effort when you consider that we're talking about thousands of chemicals. Um, and I, I don't know that 
I don't know that it would be particularly advantageous to know all of the chemicals that are on the train. That wasn't the problem, or that might have been the problem initially in not knowing what chemical they were dealing with here. But I don't think that uh, that kind of a law would be particularly effective. We're much more in favor of uh, manifest of the train's contents being carried in both the front end of the train and I believe at the, uh, if, there is a caboose. if there's a caboose in the uh, tail end of the train. Well, let me pick up on that. Is that current law or is that one of your uh, recommendations? I think, it's a, I think it's an FRA requirement today. Yeah, that it is an FRA requirement materials. that a manifest be carried w what part of the train? Well, right now, I think it's required that it be carried in the head end. Yeah, the, the conductor is, is required um, to carry a manifest that lists um, all of the hazardous materials um, and the tank cars they're in and the water they're in in the train. And do you know if that was the case in this particular derailment? I, I don't, sir. You do not know? No, sir. Okay. Let me just shift also very quickly and ask you some questions about um, imputing liability in this situation and I I just don't know EPA would probably know the answer to that I, I do not maybe I'll uh, ask the the chair if, if she uh, happens to know the answer to that give question. me the question <laughs> the question is with respect to liability for cleanup and restoration mm -hmm. is liability in this instance express and that it's codified somewhere in the law or is it implied or do we know well, let me just say what the Governor Wilson has stated on this matter, and I think he has good advisors on this, and that is that he's looking to the private sector. He's looking to SP and the liability question. That was his comment. But I, I, I don't know where else the liability would rest. It sounds to me like there wouldn't be an express liability involved, but more a general liability and implied liability under civil statutes. And I guess the Governor's indicating that mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. liability would, would primarily rest with uh, the carrier, in this case, Southern Pacific. So. I'm, I'm just in the dark on it, Congressman. Yeah. Well, I thank you very much for your responses, and I thank the Chair for the time. Sure. Well, let me finish up this, um, this panel, and thank you for being here. Uh, I'm just going to use your, um, your study here uh, as the basis for action I'm going to recommend to my colleagues. You're very clear in this study. And I'm just going to quote very briefly from portions of it. The inadequacy of the protection provided by DOT 111A tank cars for certain dangerous products has been evident for many years in accidents investigated by the Safety Board. The DOT 111A tank cars often have been unable to withstand the forces of an accident even when the train was traveling in slow speeds. The Safety Board believes that the DOT should establish safety standards based on a safety anal analysis that considers the severity of the danger to public safety posed by the release of hazardous materials and that identifies the level of protection necessary to provide an acceptable level of risk. The Safety Board is concerned that dangerous materials are being transported in tank cars without puncture protection, thermal protection, and or the benefit of thicker shells. Um, let me ask you this. If, the decision was, if a decision was made by Congress because we grew impatient with the procedure of rulemaking that for certain hazardous materials they ought to have, as you suggest, thermal protection or the benefit of thicker shells and puncture protection, shields, what would that cost to make that improvement to a current uh, tank car? Do you know? Could I, I'd be happy to try and provide it for the record, Congressman. But I would like to know that. <clears throat> and you also say, however, because of the substantial amount of time that will be required to fulfill the intent of safety recommendations, the Safety Board believes immediate action is needed to identify the most harmful materials, those that pose the greatest consequence, and to have these materials transported in stronger tanker cars that are protected by head shields and thermal jackets. And I have to tell you, this is the m most straightforward advice Congress could get. And I am very appreciative of it. And I believe that we are not going to sit around and wait for a rulemaking process that takes months and years and years. You actually said years and years. 
you have come forward with this, and we're going to figure out a way, I hope, um, to move it forward. I, um, I'm very pleased that you were here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you. Good. And our next panel is panel four. Alan Roberts, Associate Administrator, Office of Hazardous Materials Safety Research and Special Programs of the DOT. Edward English, Director, Office of Safety Enforcement, Federal Railway Administration, Department of Transportation. Donald Clay, Assistant Administrator, Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response, Environmental Protection Agency. And I'm going to ask our fifth panelist, uh, rather than a uh, fifth panel, to join in this panel. Fred Millar, Director, Toxics Project, Friends of the Earth. Are you here? If you would join the panel so we can hear from all of you and then direct our questions uh, to you. Ma Madam Chairman. Yes, Congressman. Due to a uh, long-standing prior commitment, I'm going to have to leave uh, before the, the, well, probably before the start of the testimony, let alone the completion. I wonder if I might just throw out a couple of things that I would l like to hear the, uh, the, uh, the panel address that is not in their written testimony, as I understand it. We'll it, just take a moment. If, if you would like to do that, or you can hand the questions to me, and I can get them asked for the record, well, whatever I, I your would, preference. If, I, I would like to do it. I think I can do it very All quickly, right, probably ahead. quicker than I I'm not explain have the handwriting. Answer. I'm not going to No, ask no, not now. I understand. We'll make uh, sure they... Uh, yeah, adjust. number one was, uh, was the hydrazine packaged and loaded in compliance with all federal regulations? If yes, why did so many of the containers rupture? And the following question would be, are the requirements strict enough? Are any feg federal regulations in place which would have enabled the engineer to recognize he had a broken axle? And if the answer is no, then why not? And why aren't hot boxes and dragging equipment sensors required? And are there any other safety devices which your office offices could recommend that could prevent future accidents such as the sea cliff or, or uh, Sacramento River uh, accidents? Thank you, Mr. Lagomasino. Do leave these questions sure. okay. so I can uh, refer to them, and uh, I hope maybe some of them will be uh, answered. I want to welcome uh, this last panel. I'm going to ask if you would all uh, rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please consider yourself sworn in. Uh, EPA has asked if they can proceed uh, first, so if there's no objection with that, I would ask Mr. Clay to uh, proceed. Thank Is you, Mr. Madam Clay Chairman. With, with your yes. permission, I'll submit my full statement for the record. Okay, if you could speak really directly into the microphone, I would appreciate it. All right. Let me take this opportunity to introduce some of the technical experts I brought with me this morning. On my immediate right is Henry Longus, who is the Director of the Office of Emergency and Remedial Response. Uh, next to him is Jerry Clifford, who is the Deputy Director of our Superfund Response in Region 9 in San Francisco and is very familiar with the actual site. And finally, Jim Macris at the end, who is the Director of the Chemical Emergency Prevention Preparedness Office and Chair of the uh, National Response Team. Appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning to appear before the subcommittee and discuss the, the spill in the, in the Sacramento River, the designation of substances as hazardous and how med metasodium fits into that and some of the actions we have underway to do that. Because of the expected testimony that, I, that we're about to hear and, and my detail in the uh, record, I'm going to skip over the events of the spill and go on into the listing, which I think is probably better for my summary. There is concern that metasodium was not specifically listed as a hazardous substance by the federal authorities despite its damaging effects on the Sacramento River, and we certainly share your concern with the, with the damage to the river. Designations requirements are listed under our Superfund law, which is really the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, uh, normally called Superfund, and that directed EPA to establish a list of hazardous substances. The law specified the list incorporates substances designated by other environmental laws of the agency that were being addressed for a variety of reasons, and that's important to realize. And so the statute calls for us to list the uh, under the Clean Water Act, both hazardous substances under Section 311 and toxic pollutants under 307, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, or RICRA, the Clean Air Act, and the Toxic Substance Control Act. When existing lists under these environmental laws are expanded, the subjects are automatically added to the Superfund list 
And <clears throat> so when the law is amended or we add something, it automatically goes over. In addition, we have two other ways to add materials to, to the list. We have the definition of hazardous substances, including RICRA characteristics waste. I mean, RICRA not only has waste that are listed, but we have waste that are, that are controlled by RICRA because of their characteristics, such as reactivity, ignitability, and what have you. Those also can be added. And also, we have the authority to add additional substances to the list that may present substantial danger to the public health and the welfare and the environment. And what we're using this authority for now, we have proposed several years ago in the process of adding 226 extremely hazardous substances listed under the Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act. So this will be a, something not required in the Act. Currently then, there are 737 hazardous substances on the Superfund hazardous substances list, of which approximately 80 are pesticides in the 200 and some being picked up under the, under the extremely hazardous. We have about another 75 and also being picked up automatically under the clean air is about 15 more pesticides. The Superfund law also requires the EPA to establish reportable quantities for each designated hazardous substance. These quantities trigger reporting and other requirements when amounts in excess of them are released into the environment. And this is something that is done by rulemaking. The kinds of things that we consider when we're making the reportable quantity determination include the aquatic mammalian toxicity, the chronic toxicity, and other other types of things indicate the nature of the chemical. Until EPA establishes a reportable quantity for the hazardous substance, reportable quantity is set by law at one pound, and else, else we have it under some other law, such as the Clean Water Act. And to date, we have done the 737 hazardous substance plus 42 additional substances in the Clean Air Act of 1990. The requirements then that are triggered by the designation, the designated hazardous substances released in amounts equal to or greater than the reportable quantity must be reported by the spiller to the National Response Center, which is operated 24 hours a day by the U.S. Coast Guard. National Response Center then alerts the Coast Guard or EPA, depending on where the spill or the incident is taking place, uh, the Coast Guard having the navigable waters and EPA having the rest of it. Relationship with respect to the Department of Transportation list of hazardous materials, all hazardous substances designated under Superfund are automatically included as hazardous materials by the Department of Transportation under the Hazardous Material Transportation Act. I think my DOT colleagues are prepared to talk about that today. Metasodium, then, is not specifically listed by name on any of the five lists that are automatically designated hazardous substances by EPA, the five that Congress told us to make sure always had to be there, and it's not on any of those lists for any of the other reasons. However, when metasodium is disposed, it becomes a hazardous substance because it reacts strongly with, when combined with water, and reactivity is one of the four characteristics of haz hazardous waste which EPA recognizes. Because it's strongly reacti reactive then, it became a hazardous substance when the tank car derailed and it was disposed and such came under the RICRA jurisdiction. So under that, EPA's rule then, Southern Pacific was required to report the release and is responsible for the cleanup of the spill. And we do have specific liability authority under Section 107 of the Superfund action. Let me then turn a little bit to the future actions and what we're doing in response. Let me start out by saying we share your concern about th this tragic incident. We want to ensure that there are, if there are any loopholes that we, in fact, close them. There was an emergency meeting of the National Response Team on July 22nd discussed issues arising from the chemical spill and possible actions which need to be taken at the national level. National Response Team is a unique organization of 14 federal agencies and is responsible for coordinating federal planning, preparedness, and response to the release of oil and hazardous substances. I have asked the National Response Team to form a task group to review the various federal, state, and international hazardous substances list, identify classes of substances not designated but potentially hazardous, and prioritize the identified classes based on the hazard to the public and the environment. This would, this would include a consideration of their broader listing of pesticides, and our pesticide program has already initiated an effort to take a look at the pesticides that are listed and see how they differ from those that are not listed. So there will be an internal EPA feeding into the national response effort. I'd also certainly ask this group to work with Congressman Hager and others as, as they go through to make sure that uh, uh, we have full input from, from the congressional interest. After we have that, then we'll take whatever action is appropriate, and I don't want to prejudge what's to be. However, we should keep in mind that in, in our concern to be protected, we must not overload the existing notification system by labeling all substance which is released in massive quantities could cause environmental harm. 
effect of this would be to dilute the effectiveness of calling it a hazardous label for substances that are toxic when released. And right now, we currently get about 34,000 notifications a year into the National Center, the majority of which are, of course, oil spills. But even that, we had more than 6,000 of circular notifications last year, from a full year 1990. Furthermore, let me then conclude say that most substances released in the sensitive environments in large amounts will have a certain serious environmental impact, much as the Congressman talked about earlier, the earlier spill in the Sacramento River of the pesticides, which was, I think, packaged uh, in boxes, in fact, we lost in a uh, fish kill of about 6,500 uh, fish, something like that, in 1976. So when you put in almost anything in massive quantities, then you're going to have a problem. Nevertheless, we recognize there may be gaps in our, in our list and we are taking steps to systematically take a look and address and see what they are. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. What I'm going to do uh, at this point is ask you a few questions, and then I'm going to yield to my good friend and colleague. I welcome him. I'm so delighted I was a former member of his subcommittee for a long time until I became chair of this one. He is the chair of the Environmental Oversight Committee, and I couldn't be more pleased to welcome Mr. Sinor. What I would like to do, um, Mr. Chairman, is to ask uh, EPA a few questions and then yield to you. Uh, your testimony was um, a little bureaucratic for me, so I'm going to just try to simplify it and get to the heart of the matter. Metam sodium was not on EPA's list. In plain English, can you tell me why? because the list is set up by statute as being the compilation of other lists within EPA 5 list and it's not listed on there. Well, because the list is set up by statute and what? To include five other lists from other statutes that are enforced by EPA. So because Madam Sodium wasn't on the other lists that were all codified into one list, it's not on the list. As, as a listed substance, yes. As metam sodium. Is that because it's a new a substance? No. It's not a new substance. It's been used for some time as a pesticide. Is it because somebody made a mistake in the past and didn't put it on the list? No. The Congress did not ask us to list specifically the pesticide list covered under the Federal Insecticide, Pesticide, and Rodenticide Act. So it's not statutory required. The only ad voluntary additions we have beyond the statute have been in the extremely hazardous list, which is the one we're in process of putting on now. What do you mean voluntary list? Well, the, the, one, the first list, the five lists that Congress are, are mandated, that, that's by law, that's, that will happen, and that does happen. We have to then go make a reportable quantity. We have two other ways of, of considering. We consider this chemical to be a, a hazardous substance, and, and once it was disposed of by the, trank, by the car falling off the track, it then became a, went from being a product to being a waste. Mm -hmm. Then it was, in fact, covered. It was, in fact, covered once it fell into the water and decomposed. Once the train track, once the train derailed, yes. So is it fair to say that there are other substances like that that are not on the list because when they sit in their little container, they don't hurt anybody? Those but that are, that are, those are not specifically listed and are listed only because they exhibit a characteristic until they do that, they're, they're not covered. But are you basically saying that just because Congress doesn't ask you to put something on a list, you really don't update those lists? Well, no, we didn't say that. What we did say, we were adding 273 chemicals to the list, and they were the ones that were designated as extremely hazardous. Those are very nasty chemicals, and we are adding those to it. We're in a rulemaking process Is to do that. Is sodium a nasty chemical? <coughs> it's considered mild, to, uh, middle, middle, middle range toxicity. Middle range. Yes. So is it going to be put on your list now? It's not proposed at this time. It's, it's part of what we'll look at to see if there are a series of pesticides that are, in fact, missing. You haven't moved to put metam sodium on your list even after you saw that it killed 45 miles of a river? That's true. We have not. Well, what has to happen before you put that on the list? Well, what has to happen, we have to go through rulemaking to start out with, which is, which is you'll say, takes a long time, and by, by law it does because of the notice and comment requirements. We Can't said you we take some interim steps to put these kind of chemicals on the list without waiting for the rulemaking? Well, there are criteria on what goes on the list, and that didn't make it this time. I mean, I mean that's, it's that simple. There may be a loophole. We, we, will, we are looking at the pesticide programs to see if there are a lot of 
potentially nasty chemicals there, but uh, they're not on the list now. What do you mean there may be a loophole? Well, we, when Congress put it out, they said take, the, take these lists from other EPA statutes and, and add them to the list. They didn't say take FIFRA. They didn't say take the, take the emergency planning uh, response, which is what we're doing anyway. What we've agreed to do is to go back and take a look at the pesticide list to see if, in fact, there are other pesticides that need to be listed. Mm -hmm. Right now, there are 80 on the list. We're adding 75, and we're adding 15 from the Clean Air Act. So there are a total of about uh, almost 700 active ingredients pesticides, and there are a total of about 30,000 pesticides in commerce. I don't think most people would believe that all those ought to be listed. Some of those are made in very small quantities. Lots of other reasons for listing other than just, just, just okay. the simple toxicity. Is it your position, or don't you have any, that DOT can only take EPA's list, or is it your position that DOT, for purposes of moving chemicals by rail, could incorporate into their list the Coast Guard list and other lists as well? I believe they have that authority, but I would defer to them. You believe that they have the authority to add to the EPA list and to include other substances on that list? I don't think they would add to the EPA list. I think they would add to their list of toxic materials. Ours is a list of toxic substances, which uh, hazardous substances, I'm sorry, that, that, they, that they have. So I believe well, they Well, they have said before to us, but we'll hear more from them, that they use the EPA list as their list. You did not have metam sodium. Uh, on the list. You still don't have metam sodium on the list, which perplexes me no end. Um, and, and, and therefore, if they say that they're using your list as the definitive list, what I'm asking you is, in your reading of the statutes, you don't think they need to do that. They have the authority to put anything on the list they want. Is that correct? That's my correct, but again, I would, I would prefer to defer to the, to the experts from the other agency rather than speaking for them. Do you have the authority, does EPA have the authority for a temporary designation of hazardous for metam sodium while the regulatory process chugs along at its uh, slow pace? Not to the best of my knowledge. I'd ha I give you a complete answer for the record, but my, my understanding is we do not have that authority. What stops you from uh, doing that? Well, we always operate pursuant to, to law, and uh, if the law I wonder does not if you allow knew for that, then which we can't law? Do it. Which law is, is faulty in that uh, respect? Because we certainly would want to fix that law. What law is that? Well, the, the law that's the basic is the basic Superfund law that requires the, the listing of the hazardous substances. So that's the one that specified three ways, be on another list, be reactive or what have you, or, or do it under uh, 102. And you're uh, basically saying a. that you, it is your understanding that that law would preclu preclude you from temporarily designating as a hazardous substance metam sodium which killed a 45 mile stretch of a river that's true that's my understanding i'll be happy to provide an official answer for the record from our general counsel's office but that's my understanding how do you put saccharin on the hazardous substance list and not metam sodium saccharin was listed as a RICRA hazardous waste because of the waste derived in the manufacturing of saccharin since it was regulated regulated under RICRA, it was picked up automatically under the uh, uh, 10114 section of Superfund is as being listed. I might also add there is a delisting petition in from the manufacturer to delist saccharin, but currently it is in fact covered. Let me ask you this. If you were the DOT and you experienced this kind of a situation where 45 miles of a river dead, 200 people went to the hospital, etc., would you, as an interim step, if you were allowed to, under law, add the Coast Guard list to your list of hazardous materials? Well, Given yeah. that they go over 120 or 140 bodies of water as the train goes up, just in the California example. I'm certainly not an expert on the DOT. Authority. I'm not asking you to be an expert. I'm asking you to use your common sense. You care about the environment. That's your job. Metam sodium is not on your list. You claim you can't put it on the list. It is not on the list. I find that outrageous, but that's the case. Well, I do care. It is on the Coast Guard list. And if they had adopted the Coast Guard list, they would have packaged this material differently. They would have had it in a different part of the train. I'm asking you, in light of this accident, if you were them and you had the authority, which you say you think they do, to add the Coast Guard list to their list of materials, would you do that as a prudent person? 
I would certainly consider doing that and I would look at my statutory authority to do so. And I, and I would imagine that they have to do it by rulemaking and I, I would hope that they would think, consider starting that. But the Coast Guard list was again developed for a different purpose, which was salt water. And I, I w my common sense would indicate they're probably nasty chemicals. It's certainly one of the lists that we will look at, and I've asked the, as I've asked the national response team to do that. But I can't just go around without statutory authority adding things to lists. I didn't ask you that. I asked you if you were the DOT and you had the authority to add the Coast Guard list to their list if you would do it. You said yes you would consider it if you were in their situation, if you had the statutory authority. Is that correct? Yes. I would consider it if I were them, if I had the statutory okay. authority. And f my last point is, you said you don't have the statutory authority to add metam sodium to your list. That's not quite accurate. At least if it is, I misspoke. All I right. Can't let's try that again then. All right. Can you add metam sodium to the list of hazards that you have on your list? I can do it by rulemaking probably. I have to make certain findings and I have to take a look at that. But yes. And how long will that take? Rulemaking almost never takes less than two years. Do you think you ought to have the ability to move quicker on a material that spilled into the water and killed 45 stretch, made it sterile? That's hard to say. It's, it's been moved for a number of years. It's been around for 20 years. In the last three years, we've had three reports of incidents with the chemical. Uh, the largest. What were the other reports of, of incidents with the chemical? They were mostly in the agriculture setting. The largest, was, which was five gallons. I mean. It, it and what happened? Anything happened when it? I don't have spilled? the complete detail. I just went back and checked. Have we had accident a history of accident patterns with that? We have not. Well, you had three accidents. Well, yes, but the large, which is five gallons, all in agricultural setting, I assume is somehow it's uh, spilling pesticides. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sinor. Thank you, Ms. Boxer. And first of all, let me thank you for the opportunity to join you. As you know, as the oversight chairman for EPA, as well as the pesticide program, I have a direct interest in this. Let me start with Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay, where is the Office of Pesticide and Toxic Substances today? Are they here? They are not here. Have they ever been here today? They have not been here at this particular hearing today, no, sir. Isn't that what the issue is? That basically uh, the problem at the Sacramento uh, River spill was that the pesticide staff did not talk to the Office of Solid Waste and they didn't talk to DOT? Isn't that what the problem is here? No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm, it's not clear to me that had it been listed that the, with this particular factual situation would have been don't a Don't you think they ought to be here today since this is a pesticide? No, Don't you think well, I, it was judgment, worthy, I, of their, four, three worthy of their attention to be here since this is a pesticide? Well, it's not that Linda Fisher and I have not talked about this, and she is, in fact, initiating an effort to go back and look at the pesticides that are not currently listed under... The point, under is, the point is, Mr. Clay, some parts of EPA knew that this was a toxic substance, other parts of it didn't. You're not communicating very well. No one at EPA even told DOT about the potential problem because the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Do we need to set up a hotline uh, between various uh, uh, people within your own agency so they can talk to each other? I don't think that's necessary, no, sir. As you know, we're in the process of reviewing uh, the pesticide program. You're trying to do it. You're trying to complete the review uh, from the 88th FIFRA amendments. There's going to be discoveries and re-registration going on. How are we going to solve the problem that obviously occurred here where uh, one agency didn't know what the other agency was doing. Uh, have you set up a, a way to inform the Department of Transportation of what you're doing? Yes. <clears throat> part what of is it? Part of what I've requested the national response team to do is, in fact, to take a look at all the other lists out, to, to work across the government, DOT. How, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that, Mr. Clay? Tell us specifically how you're going to do that. Well, I'm going to have Mr. Macris add to this, he wants, since he jointly chairs that. But what we're going to be doing is I've asked them to go back and take a look to make sure there are not loopholes and gaps in the coverage. That will involve working EPA working with other agencies. With, with, within the EPA... How, how are you going to work with other agencies? I, I need to pin you down on this because obviously the problem that occurred here is that EPA and DOT didn't work. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? What's the process? Well, the process for working with the other agencies through the national response team, and I'd like to defer to Jim Macris to to elaborate on that since he jointly chairs that. There will also be an internal EPA process, and as I said earlier, the assistant administrator of pesticides has already initiated an effort to start looking at some of the pesticides that are not currently listed. Mr. Clay, this is gobbledygook. What are you going to do? Outline for the committee here, outline for the public here, what you're going to do to avoid this problem occurring again 
that one agency didn't tell the other agency what the problem was. Tell me specifically what you're going to do. All right, let me, let me try one more time slowly then in terms of what we're going I to do. I can hear you fast, slow, medium. Tell the right, people well, no, what I, you're I going to do. I tend to go too fast when I, when I get excited about this. Uh, we are, in fact, I have asked the National Response Team, which is the one 14 agency federal governments, parts of the federal government that coordinate this type of effort to take a look at what happened and, in fact, to take a look at some of the other lists that we have around that have never been called a circular, a circular hazardous substance, hazardous material. Okay? So you're going to review, you're going to have this committee review something. They can some. look at the MARPOL list, which is one that we talked about earlier. They can look at the Is this group going to meet annually, semi-annually, monthly? Well, again, I would defer to Jim. Why don't we let Jim Mackers give you some of the details of what I've asked him to do. Jim, what are we going to do here? How's this going to work? What's the process? When's it going to happen? Yeah, thank you, Congressman Seiner. The national response team has already begun, as a matter of fact. At a meeting a week ago Monday with most of the agencies present, we indeed started to talk about the relationships of the Department of, the Department of Transportation lists and the Environmental Protection Agency lists. The meeting was called, as, as a matter of fact, was requested by the Department of Transportation <coughs> as a chair. The system allows any agency that wants to consult with the other agencies in a formal way uh, to, to, to do such a call, and so that was done. Uh, early in the week, partly in preparation for this hearing, partly in preparation of response to Mr. Herger's letter, and also because we realized that there were some very keen issues that had health implications, damage assessment issues, uh, class recovery issues, that there were several agencies, including the Department of Justice, the Centers for Disease Control, perhaps the Department of Defense, certainly EPA, DOT, and OSHA, that needed to talk about this. And so they've been sitting <coughs> A couple of times this week have gotten together to talk about what the next steps might be. Uh, Administrator, let, let me interrupt you right yeah. there. I'm, I'm, I'm laying the setting for what you know for what we did as as, as the as the beginning. Uh, the pesticides office was part of that discussion. That's what I wanted to add. Well, let me ask the audience: Does anybody know what the process, how, when, or where this is going to work? If raise your hand if you can tell me based upon those two answers. Not one hand went up. It's not me. I'm not stupid. Nobody got it. One let hand me went ask up. the question again. One hand went up. One, one hand went one. up. One. Yeah, I just want the from EPA. Let the record show that one hand. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. You familiar with this book, Don? Crop Protection Chemicals Reference. No, it's a I'm book. not. Sure. This is a book of labels of pesticides. I have this book in my office. I would hope to think you all would have this book down at EPA, because the same information is available to farmers. Let me read from you. This is not the same company. Uh, uh, that. It is the same chemical. Under uh, the uh, chemical we're talking, environmental hazards. Let me read it to you. This product is toxic to fish. Do not apply directly to water. Do not apply where runoff is likely. Do not contaminate water when disposing of equipment wash waters. Apply this water only as specified on the label. You want this book? Maybe I'm this sure will I help you. I can get you. one if I need one. Congress. Yeah. You want this book? Because maybe this will help you here. I mean, what does it take? I mean, these labels clearly identify this as a problem. I mean, this would be the same label we would see from the, the other manufacturer. What's the problem here, Mr. Clay? I guess the problem is the process, if you want to, to do that. We have a process we go through. We follow the law. We don't just pick a single incident and say that's a problem. Should we have gone back and uh, the previous accident happened there in 1976? And regulated pesticide um, detergents because we had 6,000 fish killed. I, I don't, we don't use the criteria of have we had an accident and what's happening. We use the inherent toxicity and lots of other reasons for, for listing things. Well, Mr. Clay, if I'll conclude with this, Madam Chairman, not only did this problem occur, but I'm not convinced it can't occur again because I've asked you what we're doing to set up a network between agencies so that it wouldn't occur again. I've given both of you a chance to outline a process, how, when, and where it's going to happen. And only with the exception of one person, no one understands what's going to happen. So this could happen again tonight. And that's just unacceptable, Mr. Clay, given the, uh, the tragedy that has occurred here, that no more effort has been put in to avoid this happening again. Thank you, Ms. Yeah, I, I would like to thank the gentleman for joining me because um, your level of uh, frustration and outrage matches mine. I. Um, can't believe what I heard today, and I'm going to repeat what I think you said. Tell me if I misstate it, please. 
or correct it for the record, that you have no intention of putting metamsodium on this list today, tomorrow. You may decide to ish start a rulemaking. That would take two years. And if, in fact, the DOT doesn't accept the Coast Guard list but continues to use your list, then metamsodium won't be on their list either. And this could happen again, and then we can kill another stretch of uh, river until maybe we just kill all the fish. I don't get it. I want to ask you something. We had 100,000 fish killed. We had 45 miles of river dead from this spill. You said you checked it out. Yeah, there have been three accidents. You don't have any move to, to put this chemical on the list in a speedy way. It's going to be shipped the same way, not labeled, and all the rest. If 45 people had been killed instead of a 45-mile stretch of river, would you have reacted a different way today? Again, the number of fish killed, the number of people killed is not the criteria we use. You have got to be kidding. Well, I'm not kidding. You're the Environmental Protection Agency, and if 45 people were killed by metam sodium, it wouldn't push you into action? It's not clear that had it been on the list, the same thing would not have happened. Certainly once it fell off the track, you can argue the probability of falling off the track, it's not clear that had it been listed, it would still not have a place card. It would have been another substance well, under Well, that there. is not what my investigation has shown so far. My preliminary briefing in Sacramento when one of your people was there was very clear that Southern Pacific said had it been known that it was a hazardous substance, it would have been in a different part of the car, it would have been in a different kind of a tank, and it would have been labeled. No, so said, you're I telling me you don't care if 100, what if 100 people were killed or 300 people were killed? You still wouldn't feel pushed to move quicker? You don't, you're making me perhaps uh, that I don't care about what happened. I do care about what happened. I do work in the Environmental Protection Agency. I worked there for a large number of years because I do care about the environment. But I also care about, care about the process we use to do this. And I'm also caring about what happened. So I do care. I, mean, Look, I, I don't doubt that you don't personally care. But I have to tell you, for those people, and I say this with due respect, who have as a stereotype a bureaucrat who will just put blinders on and go down the list of what he thinks is the right way, never to look outside, even after a couple of tragedies, this is an outrage. I, uh, I'm stunned. Well, the correction I wanted to put there, I said if, in fact, after the different location of the train, had it fallen off, I don't think it would have made a difference because uh, it was still, I mean, the original report was it was on the manifest, it was killed, carried as a weed killer. There was a number to call for Chemtrack. They knew what it was. They didn't, the original report was it was dark. They could not see. They did not think it was leaking. So your excuses or whatever, your reasoning goes that even if it had been marked hazardous and it had been on your list, it would have happened. I absolutely don't agree with you on that. SP in its discussion said they would have treated it totally differently and um, all I could suggest to you, and, I, and, and we're going to just take a break here for a vote, is that please, Mr. Clay, remember why you went into the Environmental Protection Agency. Don't be stymied because on page one of section four it says ABC for God's sakes. There's got to be a way that this government can react swiftly not to one accident, but to two. And considering the hazards that are out there right as we speak now, we will be held accountable. And it won't be so easy the next time to say, oh yeah, it was 45 people, but I can assure you, let, let's take a break, we'll come back and we'll continue our discussion. It's gonna be about, I think now, uh, probably a 20 minute break. I want to thank you all for your patience, and I hope we'll be able to complete um, the hearing in this round. Um, Mr. Clay, just to sum up your testimony, um, I would hope that there is some way within EPA under the law that you could expedite some type of emergency uh, listing here and not have to wait for 
uh, tragedy to strike before you put something on the list. And if you c can't do that, it would be very important for you to let us know if there's something we can do to change the law so that you can move, because there's no one in Congress that wants to put a straitjacket on the Environmental Protection Agency. Let me commit to going back and uh, providing for the record a, a search of our authorities to see what we have, if, if not have, the so indicate. I appreciate that. Um, I would next like to call on Alan Roberts, Associate Administrator, Office of Hazardous Materials Safety Research and Special Programs Administration, otherwise known as RISPA, of the Department of Transportation. Welcome, uh, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. Um, I am Alan I. Roberts, Associate Administrator for Hazardous Materials Safety and the Research and Special Programs Administration. I'm here today to discuss the Department's role in regulating the safe transportation of hazardous materials. The Department of Transportation regulates hazardous materials <laughs> under authority of the Hazardous Materials Transportation Act of 1974 as amended by the Hazardous Materials Transportation Uniform Safety Act of 1990. Evolving over a period of 80 years, the hazardous materials regulations have historically focused on materials in transportation which pose acute hazards to people, such as explosives and poisonous gases. Over the past decade, the regulations have increasingly been addressed to materials with less acute hazards, such as environmentally hazardous substances. In conducting our hazardous materials program, we have always stressed accuracy in classification, rigorous communication, and I believe that was alluded to this morning relative to the hydrazine incident, and the integrity of packaging. As a result, we believe that the hazardous materials transportation, that hazardous materials transportation has an overall very good safety regulation, a safety record. Last year, there were four reported deaths and 390 serious injuries resulting directly from hazardous materials transportation. During that period, there were an estimated 180 million shipments. And I might point out, Madam Chair, that each day in this country there are at least 100,000 tank truck loads of gasoline and fuel oil necessary to keep this country moving on a seven-day-a-week basis. More recently, we have upgraded incident data collection. Further, with EPA and three other federal agencies, we are implementing a national emergency preparedness program to support emergency officials who must respond to accidents involving hazardous materials. Under the HMTA, Hazardous material means a substance or material in a quantity and form which may pose an unreasonable risk to health, safety, and property or property when transported in commerce. Although the regulations cover tens of thousands of materials, fewer than 3,000 are specifically listed by name. The rest are listed under generic descriptions in 20 hazard classes, each of which has defining criteria. Some years ago, we published an advance notice in the Federal Register stating, and I paraphrase, quote, the existing definitions are generally limited in scope by reliance on testing criteria that may not provide adequate consideration of the risks that transporting some, of the, some materials may have on health and the environment. Some of these limitations in the transportation regulations can be recognized as not listing as hazardous materials those materials which, when discharged, into the environment pose imminent and substantial danger to public health or welfare, including, but not limited to, fish, shellfish, wildlife, shorelines, and beaches." End quote. My office published that notice in the Federal Register on December 9, 1976, and we commenced working with EPA to address environmentally hazardous substances. In fact, in that very same Re Federal Register notice, we published a list of materials that we believe to be environmentally hazardous materials. A few years later, Congress passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. As amended by the Superfund Amendments uh, and Reauthorization Act in 86, hazardous substances are materials which are designated by statute or, un <coughs> or by the EPA. Under Section 306A of CERCLA, each hazardous substance which is listed or designated by EPA is required to be listed and regulated as a hazardous material under the Hazardous Materials Transportation Act. 
DOT implements this requirement by listing circular hazardous substances in their respective and their respective reportable quantities, or uh, often called RQ values, in an appendix to the hazardous materials table of the hazardous materials regulations. Put simply, when EPA issues a final rule to designate additional substances, DOT also issues a final rule to add those substances to the hazardous materials regulations. For example, when EPA revised 277 entries in the circular list in August of 1989, DOT issued a final rule on August 21st, seven days. I, I want to stop here for a moment and comment on that point because it sounds rather self-serving, but it comes to Mr. Clay's comments in response to your questions, Madam Chair. And this is, this is the matter of the uh, conformance to 5 U.S.C. 553, the Administrative Procedure Act. Uh, this creates a lot of difficulty for us in the agencies, although I think most of us do agree with that statute and what it requires us to do. When I said we issued a final rule seven days after EPA issued their final rule, we did not, we were not required to comply with 5 U.S.C. 553 because the law required us to list and regulate those materials as hazardous materials. There was no wiggle room for discussion in the rulemaking process. So I, I wanted to c comment on that because it sounds self-serving otherwise to say we did it in seven days as opposed to EPA dealing with their problems and they do have significant problems <coughs> on a two-year timetable. Under the hazardous materials regulations, a shipper is responsible for properly classifying material in accordance with the defining criteria of the hazardous materials regulations and for de determining if the material is listed in the appendix to our regulations for hazardous substances. There is no provision by which a shipper may designate a material as a hazardous substance if it is not listed in the appendix. While time does not permit me to go into detail, I would like to point out that my written statement addresses matters such as the regulatory status of metam sodium, current actions to improve our regulatory program, <coughs> international action on pollutants, implementation of the Hazardous Materials Transportation Uniform Safety Act amendments, response to NTSB recommendations, and improvements to our data collection and analysis program. Uh, I would be glad to respond to your questions, Madam Chair, but I would like to point out uh, at this time the list that was referred to um, concerning the, the Coast Guard list, if I may clarify that point, comes from the international convention called MARPOL on pollutants at sea. Annex 2 of that convention deals with tankers, bulk ships, and Coast Guard has listed these materials pursuant to that convention. We've indicated <laughs> some time back our intention to propose in rulemaking, and I must uh, emphasize that point because then 5 U.S.C. 553 applies, that we would propose in rulemaking to apply the same regulatory requirements uh, or list those material for purposes of uh, hazardous materials transportation within the United States. I just wanted to make that point because uh, the uh, Coast Guard list has come up several times. It's really an international list of uh, dangerous pollutants. Thank you. Mr. Roberts, from what I gather, your hands are pretty free to add um, products to this list you can add whatever you deem a hazard. Are you going to put metam sodium on the list? And if so, at what concentrations will you deem it to be hazardous? Well, we, did, we published a final rule last December, um, <coughs> several hundred pages in the Federal Register, uh, which become, starts to become effective on October 1st. And metam sodium, uh, sodium, <laughs> sodium in concentrations of 35 percent or greater, we're fairly certain will come under that rule based on the criteria. Uh, I also indicated to you in my closing remarks that uh, we were going to propose a rulemaking on the MARPOL list under Annex 3, uh, which was just recently ratified by the United States Senate and signed by the President on June 10th. Contained in that list is metam sodium. Uh, we will propose to list that material as a hazardous material pursuant to the MARPOL list. And how long will that take, that rulemaking? It's hard to say. It depends on the uh, degree and extent of uh, controversy that may, be, may surround listing. Well, what is the it's, normal it's not just metam sodium, Madam Chair. It's several thousand different materials possibly could be brought up in the same 
uh, situation because Absolutely. we're talking about a broad spectrum of materials Absolutely. posing the That's same our type fear. of problem. Our fear is that it's not just metam sodium, it's a whole right. list of hazards that aren't on the list. So let me make sure I understand. <coughs> metam sodium is still not on the list as we sit here today. Do you have the ability to adopt the Coast Guard list and make it uh, part of your list? We have the authority, uh, clear authority, to propose to list the material as a hazardous material uh, stating that it may pose an unreasonable risk, risk to health, safety, or property. We have the authority to propose it. If I were to say we're going to adopt it, then I have prejudged the outcome of a rulemaking and would place any rulemaking that I would participate in jeopardy. I didn't ask you that. I asked if you could take the Coast Guard list. I think any thinking person knows that the Coast Guard is not going to put something on their list that they don't have to put on their list. I'm asking you to clear your mind of rulemakings and long-term things and ask you if you agree with GAO and EPA that gave a qualified answer to this and take the Coast Guard list and put it on your list, expand your list immediately without waiting for two years of hearings. Well, I, I, I have to answer the same way. I, I, I don't want to sound facetious, but sometimes I, I mean, I've been at this for almost 25 years, and I'll tell you, I'd love to cast aside the rulemaking process sometimes <coughs> and do what I think. But we have this process, and believe me, uh, members of Congress have participated at any time opposing what we were proposing to do. So it goes two ways. Now, the list is there. It's an international list. It's the International Maritime Pollution List. I understand. It's adopted I, by IMO. Sorry. It's not a Coast Guard list, I per understand. Se. I'm asking and you we, another I, question. I indicated in my testimony that we will propose to pick up that list in a rulemaking procedure and list the, all the materials on that list, not just methyl sodium, but all of them. I understand that. Put that aside. You've got a procedure. It could take two years or three years, okay? I'm asking you, do you have the authority that GAO says you have and EPA says you have of taking the Coast Guard list as it stands today and adding it to your list of hazardous materials we do without not have that a rulemaking. You do not have that we authority. We do not have that authority. Can you, Absolutely Can you not. direct me to the law in which that authority is denied? The only, the only authority we have to list directly anything is as mandated by Section 306A of CERCLA, the Superfund Act, because it says we will list and regulate as a hazardous material, any material listed under Section 104.14, is it? Or one, but it doesn't 14. say that you can't add anything else to it. No, but then all, everything else we do has to be in accordance with the Administrative Procedure Act. I cannot just go out and say um, uh, chlorine is banned from transportation tomorrow. I mean, okay. I, I, so I, you I, have I, I have to propose the ban chlorine okay. from transportation tomorrow and listen to the merits of the comments. That's the process. Do you know how many years the Coast Guard has considered metam sodium a hazard? Um, well, I heard that. I know we've all been working on the international pollution list. I met with Admiral Keim, who is now the Commandant, on this very topic several years ago uh, when we <laughs> agreed that as the international list became ratified as a marine uh, for marine pollutants, we would pick up the packaged materials for hazardous materials regulation and propose their regulation in the United States. Okay. You have a strong disagreement then with the GAO, the General Accounting Office, and this subcommittee, and with uh, EPA, you say that you are prohibited by law from taking the Coast Guard list of hazardous materials and adding it to your current list so that when metam sodium or any of the other materials that the Coast Guard has in the list are, are being shipped on a rail car, they will not be labeled hazardous any time in the near future. Is that correct? We are not prohibited by law from listing methyl sodium as a hazardous material. That's not what I said. I said we must conduct a rulemaking to propose. I didn't ask you that. Listing. I asked you, I'm going to ask it again. Do you disagree with the GAO and the EPA that you could, if you wished, take the Coast Guard list without a rulemaking procedure and add it to your current list of hazardous materials? I'm sorry, ma'am. I did not hear the GAO say that. I know what I know. I'm familiar with what the GAO said. The GAO, GAO said, said it, and if you will wait, I'll find it in their testimony. If you will wait one moment, please. We'll take a little break while I find it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh -huh. 
GAO stated in answer to my question that you could, in fact, use their list. In their written testimony, they point out that metamsodium is on the list, and they say that although you, you cannot take a Superfund-designated sus substance off the HAZMAT list, under their reading of the Superfund provision, you are not precluded from adding materials to the list if you determine on the basis of other information they would pose a re an unreasonable risk, and then they talk about the Coast Guard. That's exactly correct, uh, correct, Madam Chair. I, I fully agree with their statement. Uh, when they say determined, that's determined in accordance with the rulemaking process. It doesn't mean I can arbitrarily just issue a final rule and decide f what unilaterally that uh, such and such is a regulated material. I don't hold that authority. We do not hold that authority. So you, you're saying that under the current law, you cannot take the Coast Guard list and add it to your list without a two-year rulemaking procedure? I, I didn't say anything about two years. Well, how long uh, would it t take at the minimum? Well, uh, we had rulemakings that we finished in a matter of weeks, and we've had rulemakings that took a matter of months, and we've had several rulemakings that take, take a matter of years. I, it depends on the nature and the controversy of it. Let me, let me explain something to you, if you will. If uh, we were to automatically go and regulate metam sodium, we have to do an analysis. There's a, several statutes we must comply with when we publish, and we have to certify. And one of them is the Flexibility in Government Act. And when we do that, we have to take into account that this material is now regulated by tank truck. Now, this is a very important product in the agricultural industry. If we say it's regulated by tank truck because it's a hazardous material, it's a hazardous substance. Pursuant to the Motor Carrier Act of 1980, automatically the person subject to that regulation has to have $5 million insurance rather than $1 million insurance to haul this product down the public highways. That could have severe impact in certain segments of our community. We need to look at that. We need to make an assessment and make a determination uh, on a benefit-cost basis as to the merits of moving ahead with a rulemaking in that area. We cannot well, we all know that regulate. anything we do here <clears throat> has an impact on economics. But let me assure you, that the 45 miles of Dead River in Sacramento area has had an incredible impact. I understand that. Okay? So, when you're thinking about the impact on the shipper, if you're thinking of the impact on the manufacturer and the mover of the product and the rail line, you better figure what happens to a community when this stuff spills. And I'm saying here, I'm quoting again from GAO, you're not precluded from adding materials to the hazmat list if you determine on the basis of other available information mm -hmm. that they may pose an unreasonable risk to health and safety. Now, is yes. the Coast Guard list, because it, it seems to me that's the simplest way to move forward on this. You're saying a, a, a rule could take you as little as three weeks, is that right? Depends on the nature of the, the topic, but this is well, a rather... Well, what about this topic? What about well, this is a rather those? substantial list, so we'd have to do no, a rather no, detailed assessment. No, you didn't let me finish my question. What about the topic of adding metam sodium to the list after two 
uh, after three accidents with the product and one resulting in the death of a river. I would think that, uh, Madam Chair, that the, many of the commenters would come back and say it's illogical because of the other materials we must assess having posing the same degree of danger and we're just jumping in and picking one. It's and illogical we, we to pick a material that. out that you just saw killed 45 miles of river. It's illogical to pick that material out? No, it would be people in the commenting process would claim it's illogical for us to jump in and pull one product out in the middle of the spectrum of dangerous things and regulate it and not what regulate other materials posing the what same risk. What if it killed 1,000 people? I'm sorry? What if it killed 1,000 people? Well, I would like to think that if it has that potential, we already regulate the material and uh, rather substantially. What if it did? Would you say the same thing that the EPA person said? It, no, it still it has to take its course? No, it would already be covered by our regulations because we have, we have criteria for dermal toxicity, inhalation toxicity, and oral ingestion toxicity. Uh, within the last year, we expanded our ingestion toxicity by 10 times. Go ahead, continue. We, we expanded it for, by 10 times. Uh, so now, even without the EPA listing of materials such as malathion, we regulate malathion as a hazardous material. So what you're saying is that the public should feel secure that they're not going to suffer any death from these hazards because there's no product on the market that would kill them that isn't on the list. No, I can't say that. Well, that's what you just said. You said it wouldn't be. If it killed people, it would already be taken care of. You said that. But the law requires us to look at quantity and form it, that it's pres presented for transportation. And we do that. You for example, there is, there is chlorine in drinking water. Mm -hmm. Obviously, nobody's going to suggest that we regulate drinking water because it contains chlorine. At some level of uh, solution, or reduction of concentration, you stop regulating the material in the same category as when it was 100% concentration. Did you know that metam sodium might be fatal if absorbed through the skin? Are you aware of that? That's on a material safety data sheet. They say that for thousands of products. Uh, I, I, we're aware of its dermal So you don't toxicity. believe it's true with the labeling? You think I they have put the same data sheet in front of me, ma'am. Well, I'm reading it to you. I don't, I don't dispute anything on that sheet. Good. Then I don't understand your response that it would be illogical to add metam sodium to the list. And the fact that some people might complain about it, for God's sakes, people complain about everything. Trust me on that. Everything you do here, half the people like and half don't. We're supposed to rise above that and be leaders here and say, if this thing spilled into the water and it caused this damage, that it shouldn't take two years. I want to ask you something because as I understand it, you may be adding metam sodium to the list. It may take years. We don't know. But you said in concentrations of 35% or more. Do you know that it's normally shipped at 32.7% concentration? Uh, we didn't know that at the time we issued this rule. The rule is based on criteria. And based on the best criteria or data we have available, the dermal toxicity of this material would make it a DOT-regulated poison come October 1st because of its dermal toxicity based on criteria. Well, considering the environmental damage metam sodium did at 32.7, don't you think you ought to re-examine the 35% threshold? Uh, this is from the standpoint of acute toxicity. Now, we're th I mean, the other issue here is it's environmental risk, and I indicated we are pro going to propose to publish all the lists on the Marpole Annex 3 list, and that includes metham sodium. And it wouldn't be listed then at a 35%, it would just be listed I'm not sure how Marpole lists it. That's a, that's a good question, but I believe it goes down to much more dilute concentrations. I'm told a 10 percent on the other list. I believe list. that's correct. That means it would be 90 percent water and 10 percent methyl sodium, and mm -hmm. it would still be subject to the Marpole Convention requirements. Is it fair for me to tell my constituents when they ask that despite the accident, with metam sodium, despite the hearing, that unless Congress acts, that there's no guarantee that metam sodium will be added to this list in the immediate future. I am not permitted to tell you, pursuant to procedures of our government, that it will be listed as a hazardous material. I cannot guarantee you that. If I do, 
that I place myself outside the bounds of the rulemaking process, I'd have to re remove myself from the action. So is it fair for me to tell my constituents that there's no certainty that metam sodium would be added to the list at the concentrations in which it just spilled uh, in the near future. Because I wasn't able to find out from the people who were supposed to know how long it will take, how long the rulemaking will take, and there is no authority to take the Coast Guard list without extensive hearings and add it to this list uh, that you already use. Is that a fair thing to say? Well, I've answered it the best I know how, Madam Chair. I, I just am not permitted to tell you in a conclusive way the action that will be taken on this material. Well, okay. Then I cannot there's assure a, There's a, there's I a case called assure the Home anyone. Box Office case, very famous case, where all the efforts in a regulatory case were thrown out by a court because of prejudgmental comments by the officials managing the rulemaking. And we're very carefully cautioned by our general counsel not to make those types of statements in mm -hmm. any public mm -hmm. forum. Okay. Excuse me. So because of legal problems, you are not permitted to tell me whether you think that metam sodium will be included on this list in the near future. That is correct. May I give you an analogy to this? Uh, in the Hazardous Materials Transportation Uniform Safety Act, there was two requirements in that act. One is for us to go into a very large scale shipper carrier registration program. The other one is for a requirement for um, training programs. In that act, there was a specific exclusion. We were specifically excluded from the, the requirements of the uh, Paperwork Reduction Act, information collection activities. We do not have to do any paperwork burden assessment in carrying out our training regulations, which are going to be issued shortly, nor are we required to do that pursuant to that law for the registration program, which is going to involve us in registering hundreds of thousands of entities in this country and collecting money from them. Um, th so we do not have to go through that process. I do not have that type of waiver from the Administrative Procedure Act. We operate pursuant to 5 U.S.C. 553. Fortunately, we don't operate under 5 U.S.C. 554 like OSHA has to, or we'd never get anything done. Uh, but we must follow the APA process. That's the law. I understand it's my job the law. to carry it I out. I understand the law. Okay. So. What I don't understand, frankly, and, and, and maybe this is something Congress has to address, is how we can have a situation where we have this terrible damage done to a community, where we know the results of what happened to this uh, chemical. Some people say it killed a million fish. The lowest estimate is 100,000. We know what it's doing to the soil. We had another terrible accident down south. And I can't get from A to B. And as far as I'm concerned, it's unacceptable. Let me ask you a question. May I respond about, to that point, Madam Chair? No, because it wasn't a question. It was a comment. I, I can't no. get from A to B. And you want to try to get me from A to B? Go ahead. No, you made a comment about the accident, what rulemaking would have done. I'd like to just comment on that point, if I may. I have in front of me a copy of the railroad's way bill. On the train was a consist. And the consist numerically numbers the cars from the locomotive on back. And under this car, this car number, uh, GATX19764, is against a way bill, which was quickly access, accessed in the uh, telecommunications of the railroad. On the way bill are the words metam sodium, weed and tree killing compound. Immediately below it, it says emergencies call Chemtrek, 800-424-9300. Now, what it does not have on it is the DOT classification. So that's, that's a point against this way bill. Uh, because there was no DOT classification and uh, there was no placard on the car. Well, it was in the middle of the night and the car was down in the creek, so the more important information was through the consistent way bill. Now, I'm just pointing out that there, uh, that plus the fact it was a DOT specification tank car and the car had a gross weight of uh, 
254,000 pounds, that's over 125 tons, I doubt very much if much would have been different had the material been regulated by the U.S. Department of Transportation as a hazardous material. Now we can criticize the existing DOT regulatory program, if we will, which we think is quite extensive, but in this, the facts of this particular case do not lead me to conclude there would have been any much different Well, for result. someone who is so careful about not wanting to comment, I have to tell you that SP told me something completely different, which is that they would have put it at a different place in the train, it would have been marked, it would have been different. So there is a difference of opinion. Let me go on to another issue, and that is the way the uh, hydrazine was being carried in 55-gallon steel drums. Do you think that type of um, way to carry such a, an item is, is safe? Well, first of all, it was not hydrazine. As Mr. Colstead pointed out, it was almost 50 percent water. Right. It was We're a fortunate. very corrosive compound. It's used in boiler uh, cleaning, cleaning boiler tubes. And it's very effective as a boiler cleaner. Um, the packaging was a DOT specification 37M. When you M. say, you know, it's aqueous hydrazine. Aqua. hydrazine. Okay, so when you say it's not hydrazine, that's, if it was water, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a problem, right? Well, it's just a matter of strength. I we mean, understand. Uh, it's like uh, any product. The more you w water it down, the less potent it is in most right. cases. It had hydrazine in it, didn't oh, it? Oh, yes, ma'am. And it Absolutely. was highly corrosive, very corrosive and poisonous. Very corrosive. Okay, fine. Because every time I say this, it wasn't hydrazine. Well, 100% hydrazine is a material that uh, does warrant considerable concern and care. 50% hydrazine, right? Is that yes. what it was? But we'll anhydrous, it anhydrous hydrazine, which is no water, is a very dangerous material. Nobody would deny that point. Okay, it was 50% hydrazine, and it was carried in uh, a drum that was this uh, thick. You think uh, that's a safe way? I can't tell how thick that is. I know it was a DOT 37M drum, and it had a 2SL polyethylene liner about 45 thousandths of an inch thick. That's the DOT standard for it. That package. Point oh three one hundredths of an inch was how thick it was. Do you think that's a safe way to carry uh, that type of a product? Well, we got a big problem in this country. If it's not, man, there's about 35 million drums a year made that way, hauling hazardous materials. Well, I'm asking you uh, not to give me a well. An analysis uh, of what we've got. I'm trying you, to find uh, out what to do to make it better. Do you think I, it's safe to carry that we, type of product in that type of casing? We have just completely reissued our packaging regulations, 327 pages in the Federal Register, to adopt the United Nations recommendations for the transport of dangerous goods. This material would have come in packaging group two. There's a three-group mm -hmm, system. Mm -hmm. Hydrazine itself, the raw material would be group one and very dangerous. Yeah. The packaging tests for, in the international system, are roughly equivalent to the tests that were applied by DOT to that package prior to the adoption of these new rules. That's basically, it must stand a four-foot drop test and a certain pressure and leakage test. Now, this train was in a very violent act, uh, action. Anybody looks at the wreckage and the forces that went into the freight container, which was on the floor of the trailer, this was not a piggyback trailer, would recognize quickly that there were very, very violent forces uh, in, uh, into the, the, the freight containers and the drums. I doubt if this drum or any drum that any rational person would promulgate for regulatory purposes would have survived that type of impact. So under the new UN regulations that you are adopting? That's correct. We have adopted them. You have adopted them. Is that the way it would look in a Group 2 package? Group 2 package. It, it would have met that standard? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, according to the NTSB, they say one of the big problems is we've got to move to better and thicker type of containers. Do you agree with that? Well, I didn't hear it exactly like that. They talked about the thickness of the uh, 111 tank car, and uh, I don't think anybody's going to dispute the fact that the 111 tank car is the thinnest of all uh, of the tank cars that we, of any prominence that we have in our regulatory system. So you didn't hear it that NTSB has for a long time been calling for uh, better tank cars and stronger tank cars. Tank cars, cars yes. Well, they, have, uh, they have advocated on a number of occasions improvements in tank cars. Many of their recommendations we've already carried out. And I have, a here, I have with me here one of our rulemaking documents that provides a complete history of all our retrofits of tank cars and new standards 
uh, and that is also an open rulemaking procedure under our docket HM 175. Do you think we should be moving quicker to better kinds of tank cars? There are a number of tank car improvements that we view as being necessary. Right now we're reviewing comments in response to a notice on this where we ask a series of questions soliciting public views as to where we should go with future tank car okay. rulemakings. Because just because you didn't hear me say it, I'm going to read it out of the NTSB sure. report. You re they recommended that there be immediate action. Immediate. What does immediate mean to you? We're talking about tank cars? Yeah. Well, we were, we were talking action. about the drums for uh, hydrazine. Talking about the tank cars. I asked you another question oh, after sorry. that about tank cars. Okay. Immediate action be taken to identify the most harmful materials and have them transported in stronger tank cars. That would be a change from the DOT 111 specification to the DOT 105 specification. This is a pressure tank car. Uh, NTSB has advocated that examination on a number of occasions and uh, on a number of occasions we've followed their recommendations, uh, especially in the area of what we call poison inhalation hazard materials. And are you moving quickly now to, uh, to recommend that we go away from the 111A and towards stronger cars? You have a rulemaking, or there is a rulemaking. FRA has a rulemaking, I believe. Is that correct? We have a rulemaking out on that very point right now, so I cannot respond How to that How long do you comment. think it would take for that rulemaking? Uh, we're trying completed. to get a notice together within the next couple of months, but uh, <laughs> we have uh, a number of rulemaking projects underway required by the Hazardous Materials Transportation Uniform Safety Act that have taken much of our resources uh, to move on, and so we've uh, been delayed. Speaking about your resources, um, the GAO's 91 report examining the budget practices of RISPA for 90 and 91. The Senate Appropriations Committee indicates that funds appropriated for programs were used instead for furniture and niceties like a public affairs consultant. <clears throat> and in fact, in 1990, RISPA spent five times the amount budgeted for equipment and furniture, and in 91, three and a half times the amount budgeted for furniture and equipment and you took it away from funding for hazardous material container testing and enforcement, for assessment of the hazard of transporting certain hazardous materials, and even cut back on printing additional copies of the emergency response guidebook. Um, who is responsible for making these funding decisions? The overall decision is the administrator's decision. In light of what has occurred in the two recent spills, uh, is there going to be another look at that budget? Well, I might point out that probably the worst budget we've ever received in our life, we just got on a house mark. If, if we live with that, we are, our program is in very serious trouble. Is that because of the, the uh, action taken by the administrator? Do you think that that came to the attention of the uh, Congress? All I can do is read what's in the house mark, and a number of things were considered unnecessary. Uh, for example, R&D uh, for uh, operation of our test lab for enforcement uh, who, who was totally canceled. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they were afraid you'd spend it on more chairs. Well, Madam Chair, I don't know, I don't know what that issue is about. Uh, there was $14,000 spent on furnishings. And we had a new deputy administrator who had no, absolutely no furnishings in his office. Uh, all I can tell you is I've been in our administrator's office. Now, I don't study his desk. If he has a new desk, I'm not sure of it. But all the rest of the furniture in that office has been in there since two administrators back. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure where this uh, $14,000 went. But uh, if that, and I understand that's the issue. I mean, well, there's no, some other, there was, a, there was other that. monies used for administrative purposes that I fully support. For example, months delay getting a personnel action process for lack of personnel staffing. Months delay in getting procurements and contracts out for lack of procurement staffing. Now, these are uh, concerns I've expressed on a number of occasions. Matter of fact, I've strongly recommended the administrator that he create a contracting office so that we can get on about our business. Now, well, I, I can't speak. It's my understanding I have the budget here of what was done by the administrator. Sure. And it looks to me that the uh, budget for hazardous materials was decreased by 61%. Internally, in other words, we gave you the budget, and the budget here was decreased by 61%. And what I would like to do is give this to you, 
And uh, we're talking about a, a heck of a lot more than $14,000. Well, I'm, yes, but you, I was speaking while you were reading that. I'm sorry. Um, we, uh, we had to staff up a contracting office, a personnel office. Uh, we tried to get some automation in there. We tried to get uh, desktop uh, word processing on everybody's desk because it's efficient and saves us uh, um, many FTE. For example, uh, we moved 10,000 discretionary actions through our office last year. That's a lot of paper. We regulate and classify and review every explosive manufactured in the United States, civilian and military. This is no minor undertaking. And this takes resources to do it. Personnel staffing, contracting, all the other support has always been shortchanged in RSPA ever since its creation in 1979. Well, I can only say that these problems should be brought to the attention of Congress because when we put forward a budget uh, for the hazard hazardous materials function, which we think is very important and dangerous, and GAO is telling us it's a problem, and we see it uh, cut by 61 percent over a million dollars. We're not talking $14,000 here. That's a red herring. Uh, we've got a problem. So I would like to see if I can, I'm going to write a letter to the administrator. I would like to see uh, where that money went. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Robertson. We're going to go to the FRA now. Edward English. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. I am. Uh, I, I can't hear you. If you sorry. Use the, uh, uh, I am Edward R. English, Director of the Office of Safety Enforcement for the Federal Railroad Administration. I would like to present some very limited remarks concerning FRA's uh, status of, the invest of our investigation into the two accidents that occurred in, in California over the recent weeks. Uh, the first uh, accident uh, in uh, Northern California, we have still not been able to arrive at a uh, specific cause for this accident. There were no defects found in the track. <coughs> Excuse me or the derailed cars that could have been a causal factor for that accident. Uh, we are now concentrating our efforts uh, to finding out the origin of some longitudinal stresses uh, that seem to have forced the derailed cars over the inside rail of the curve on the bridge. Several likely scenarios have been ruled out and we are now concentrating our efforts at looking at uh, the locomotive units that were involved in that train. Those units were taken to Eugene, Oregon, where extensive tests and inspections were carried out by FRA personnel. From these tests and inspections, we were able to determine that some mechanical problems on the second and third unit led to power surges just before the derailment. Uh, this may be the source of the longitudinal force stresses that I mentioned earlier. We are also conducting a computer simulation uh, replicating the trip of the derailed train through the area. Uh, the results of, the, of this uh, computer activity will provide an understanding of locomotive and car behavior just before the derailment occurs. Uh, and as a result of our investigation to this point, uh, we are considering some uh, various enforcement actions uh, against the carrier based on defects discovered on the locomotives. Uh, one additional uh, comment I would like to make concerning the derailment in Northern California, uh, we should be care very careful not to, uh, to leap to some unfounded conclusions. Uh, we know that the track that was operated over is in a mountainous stretch of railroad, and we know that it is a difficult stretch of railroad to operate over. However, uh, the SP uh, and many other railroads operate over mountain uh, terrain, and it is their responsibility to, uh, to use extra care and maintenance and staff training to, to cope with the rigors of, of that kind of operation. With respect to the accident in Southern California, our investigation is still ongoing. Uh, we do know that the cause of the accident was a bearing failure on the 17th head car, uh, but we have not uh, completed the, the investigation to determine whether all the regulations, uh, uh, federal regulations were complied with. Uh, we, uh, we hope that uh, as of today we'll be able to get in and make a uh, detailed inspection of the derail cars, uh, finish our interviews, and make that determination. Uh, that uh, completes uh, our act, uh, description of our activities. 
uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you very much, Mr. English. <clears throat> the subcommittee has received some rather disturbing information regarding Southern Pacific's maintenance of their equipment, especially their locomotives. This is particularly disconcerting because you have already indicated that problems with the locomotives are a, pop a probable cause of the July 14th accident. You've also told staff that 31 percent of the 2,800 violations SP has been guilty of since 1985 were related to locomotive problems. That's correct. Were any or all of the locomotives involved in the July 14th derailment recently cited for any nonconformance with safety or other regulations? Uh, I cannot answer that question. I don't know whether any of the locomotives were, were recently cited. I, I don't know that. Uh, we, ha we are in the process of collecting uh, uh, maintenance and repair records on those locomotives, uh, and, and that is part of our investigation. So you don't know at this point no, whether uh, any or all of the locomotives involved in July 14th derailment were recently cited? No, I do not know. And that. when will you know that? Uh, I will be able to find that out in the next several days when we finish gathering repair records and looking at uh, past inspection records. When you do cite uh, a failure, what happens then? Uh, it, uh, it depends on what, on what action we take. If we, uh, if we cite a, uh, a, a defect, uh, the defect is reported to the carrier and uh, the carrier is, uh, uh, takes whatever necessary action is ne necessary to bring the locomotive or piece of equipment into compliance. Do they uh, show you that the work has been done? Do, they, do you require that they show you a written uh, affidavit of what they've done to the locomotive to repair it? The, uh, the only time that a written affidavit or a uh, certified notice is sent back to the FRA is when a locomotive is removed from service by an FRA inspector. Uh, if it is a, a, just a normal inspection report, uh, no, there is no uh, written uh, uh, notification back to FRA. So it is possible that you could um, find a problem with a locomotive uh, and cite the problem, and I assume, do you give a citation? Yes, we do. We okay. Give a, we civil, give a civil fine is levied or uh, whatever. And then it's possible that the uh, SP in this case wouldn't make the uh, correction. Is that possible? That is possible. I don't know if you know the answer to this. Were all four locomotives in full compliance with FRA regulations when they left the yard in West Colton, the origin of the train that derailed on July 14th? Uh, I cannot answer the question whether they were in full compliance when they left West Colton. I, do, I can tell you that uh, when we inspected the locomotives in U Eugene, Oregon, that we did find uh, uh, defective conditions, and those are the conditions that we are bringing uh, action against the SP for. It's our understanding that SP has approached a 90 percent failure rate on its locomotives during recent assessments by federal and state inspectors. Is this true? Uh, we have conducted recent uh, what we call task force activities uh, in the month of June of 1991 at various locations on the SP and uh, there were occasions when up to 90 percent of the locomotives were found to be defective. Hmm. There were occasions on your surprise inspections that 90 percent failed. Um, and what you told me before is that in such cases, you don't have any way of knowing that they've corrected the problem. You cite them, you find them, but under the way you work things out, it's up to them to do it unless you've removed a locomotive from service. You don't know if they make the corrections. That's correct. Your own documentation um, 
bears the fact that there has been an outrageously high percentage of defects, which you have pointed out. I, I don't mean to put you on too much of a spot, uh, but I'm not an expert in railroad inspections. Is this usual? Uh, this type of rate? Uh, no, it's not. And that's why we have continued to uh, uh, conduct these uh, uh, task force activities. That's why we continue to, uh, to file violations against the SP. As, uh, as you've already mentioned, the majority of the violations that we have filed over the last five years are for locomotive defects. Mr. English, I have a question. Was there ever any occasion when FRA was inspecting Southern Pacific and the inspection was called off in the middle of the work? Uh, I cannot answer that. I, I heard that mentioned earlier, and I do not know of any occasion where, uh, where we were conducting a task force activity on the SP and the task force activity was canceled. I do not, uh, I have no knowledge of that at all. You have no knowledge of it. There are other people that have informed this, this subcommittee of such an occasion, and you cannot confirm or deny that? I cannot confirm or deny that. Uh, today was the first uh, time that I, uh, I heard about it, and we will certainly look into that issue. You say that this failure rate is high for railroads. Can you give us an idea of other railroads and their average failure rate of these surprise inspections? Uh, I can provide that for the record. I would, I would hesitate to, to do that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. If you would hold off one second, I have one of your documents here. I, I just want to ask my staff before I ask your question. We'll take just a couple of minutes. Thank you for your patience. And Mr. English, I appreciate your very direct answers. It's uh, refreshing to me. Is it true that two years ago uh, in an inspection in um, is it Arizona? I think it was Arizona that uh, trains were pulled out of service SP trains were pulled out of service because of the high defect rate? Uh, if, if you meant that do, as a result of our inspections, some trains were not, uh, SP could not operate trains because of locomotive defects, uh, that, that is a, a, a very definite possibility and it has happened before, yes. It has happened before. Yes. So that the impact of your finding these serious defects is certainly could be devastating to a railroad carrier if they are forced to remove their trains from service. Is that correct? Uh, it, uh, it, it, not could, it not only could be, it is. I see here the, um, we, we do have some documentation on this. Okay. It says here in February 1990, the FRA effectively closed down uh, the Tucson facility for 48 hours. The resultant service disruptions jeopardize $225 million in revenues to the railroad, and even more importantly, they say, threaten the loss of goodwill by thousands of their customers. So obviously, they 
are less than happy with um, inspections that lead to the removal of trains from service. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. That's why we do it. I understand. I have here a memorandum that your good people gave us. It shows the type of inspections, the dates and locations. And there's one here. It goes to my question of, a, of an inspection being stopped midstream. If you, would, if you can find this in your, it's the July 14th document, excuse me, July 24th document, 1991. I have it. Um, in it, it shows that in Los Angeles, uh, only 35 units were um, inspected. And it does seem to me that the number of locomotives inspected in that yard is quite small. Isn't the LA yard one of SP's largest yards and would therefore contain a large number of locomotives? Why were only 35 locomotives inspected? Um, you were finding an 85% failure rate. Um, why would it be only 35 locomotives I, inspected I, there? I, I cannot answer that, uh, that question. The, uh, uh, I, can, I can comment. Uh, uh, the Los Angeles facility is, is not a, a big facility with a, a large locomotive shop, uh, does, not, uh, does not have a lot of through freights coming and, and changing locomotives. Uh, the, the locomotives that we look at in the Los Angeles area are mostly uh, originating freights and uh, local freight trains that operate in and around that area. Uh, 35 is not a, uh, an insignificant number. Uh, particularly when you uh, find the 29 are defective, uh, uh, that uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't alarm me at all. I can certainly look at uh, uh, the number and look at the dates to see if uh, uh, what happened, but uh, uh, it doesn't seem unusual. Mm -hmm. Well, it is one of the smallest number of units inspected on that particular list. I will certainly check. So and provide I would you appreciate it because it looked like mm -hmm. the way it was going. Uh, you found 29 units defected, defective out of 35 inspected, 98 defects. Um, do you feel that the FRA has been uh, tough enough on uh, Southern Pacific? Yes, I do. I think that we have a very effective uh, uh, inspection program, not only on the SP, but on all the railroads. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that collecting half of the uh, fines is a good record and taking three years to do it is a good record? Uh, the, uh, the only comment that I can make there is that uh, the, enforcement, uh, the enforcement people uh, file the violations with their Office of Chief Counsel. Uh, the Office of Chief Counsel uh, uh, bundles those violations and handles them through the claims collection process and, uh, and that is a function that, uh, that they take care of. Uh, I do know that violations presently are being handled in a lot quicker fashion than they have been in the past uh, and and the administrator has uh, made a commitment for the agency to be uh, within one year of filing a violation and, and handling it with the railroad and we anticipate being at that uh, at that point by the end of this year uh, the amounts that's collected would have to be addressed by our office of chief counsel There is a pattern of problems with the SP locomotives, as yes. you have agreed and we have learned. And my question here is, do you think that the system ought to be improved so that when you do issue a violation, you have to get some proof from SP that they have fixed the problem? In other words, are we too lax? Are we saying uh, to the railroads, here are 39 defects, you're fined X number of dollars, now fix them, and then we're not even asking for proof that they were fixed. This seems well, like a problem uh, to me. One of the, and, and let me just explain the process we go through, and, and one of the, uh, the, the ways that we look at, at equipment is that we make inspections at, at locations and we look at the equipment that's available. Uh, and, 
and fixing that that piece of equipment is is really not the the issue what you're trying to do is to make sure that that facility complies with the regulations and does the job that that they should be doing uh, that piece of equipment whether it be a car or locomotive uh, as you mentioned before uh, will move on and it's not a fixed facility very difficult to 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 go back and monitor a particular car or locomotive what we do in the mechanical end is we make follow-ups and monitor the performance of a location to see okay. that I mean, maybe I'm not making myself clear. When I get issued a violation, let's say I'm driving a car and the turn signal light is out, okay? Okay. I'm unfortunate enough that a highway patrol comes behind me, to pull over, your turn signal's out. We're not going to give you a ticket today, but here is a written citation. When you get it fixed, you send it in. Let us know it's done, okay? Mm -hmm. I take care of it, and that's the end of it. I don't understand why we can't have a similar system here. And, and in the areas where we have fixed facilities, track and signals, the railroads do report back to us on repairs that are made. That way you can take that, that mm -hmm. citation and, and just as with your turn signal, if the, uh, if the police wanted to come out and see that you really did it, they could they come right. out to your house and say, let me see the turn signal. That's, uh, we can take that uh, piece of paper that they send back to us on, the, on a track defect, for example. We can go out to that specific piece of track and we can say, yes, you made the repair. Very difficult to take a car or locomotive and say, I want to look at that. It may not be in Los Angeles. It may be in uh, uh, Weehawken, okay. New Jersey. All right. So that's one of the reasons why we don't... We, we don't try to get that, that kind of information back. Uh, okay. We Let feel that the process we do is, is, uh, uh, fits our needs. Okay. Well, I would like to suggest to you that if these locomotives that you have continually been citing were to blame for these accidents, I think you ought to th rethink this. Sure, you may not be able to find it. It may be somewhere else. But you have a piece of paper. You at least allow the company um, you at least force the company, if you will, to address the issue. For all you know, they're not doing anything. Listen, there have been stories um, where business sits around in a circle and says, it'll cost us so many millions to fix the stuff. Let's pay the fine and hope nothing happens. This isn't so unusual. You know, when uh, everything is done on a dollar loss profit that. basis, right? I mean, absolutely we all know that happens. Yeah. Decisions are made different ways. Our role here is to protect public safety. I mean, frankly, I hope all the businesses in America do well. I think that's important for us. But they better not do well at the expense of public safety. And the point is that I would hope as a result of these accidents that you might consider, and let me ask you if you would consider the possibility of a, of a citation on, on a uh, locomotive, for example, uh, being issued and they having to respond to you with proof that they fixed it. Uh, even if you don't have to follow up with an inspection. It's, uh, I can assure you that we will uh, look at that issue and, uh, and get back with you. Uh, that would be very good. Yeah. Um, was there ever an embargo issued on surprise inspections by the FRA of SP for a six-week period this year? An embargo. An embargo. If, uh, on these assessments. Uh, due to the fact that the uh, the field staff uh, 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 reports uh, to my office, uh, uh, I I did not issue any embargo on. I'm not asking if you issued it. Did someone else issue it? Uh, not to my knowledge. No. Is it possible that it was a six-week embargo on these assessments this year on SP? Uh, well, uh, believe me, in, in this world anything is possible, but uh, I don't think that uh, anyone gave that, those instructions to the field not to conduct task force assessments on the SP. So you know of no such suggestion, recommendation, verbally or written? That is correct.
does it um, upset you, this, this rate of defects in SP? And if so, um, how long will you can, uh, allow them to continue to operate when they have such a, a failure rate? Uh, it certainly upsets me. And, and uh, again, we, uh, one of the reasons that we go through the, the task force activities, uh, we file the violations, we continue to make uh, inspections, we continue to sit and meet with, uh, with their management people in an effort to bring about changes on their, on their property. Uh, uh, how long do you do, uh, how long do you go through this process? Uh, uh, you, uh, you go through, as, you do whatever is necessary and whatever you can do to, to bring about change and, and, uh, and make that railroad safer. Uh, well, I would encourage if, you to, to move on this quickly because there's a lot of people who are counting on you, including this subcommittee, uh, to move forward because these last few days have been kind of rough, the last few weeks. Uh, I, I can believe uh, it's, uh, it's been rough on me and I'm sure it's been a lot rougher on those people in California. Uh, uh, when we look at, at accidents on the SP, uh, their accident rate uh, over the past five or six years uh, is uh, about half of, it, half of what it was in, in the early 80s and late 70s. They have made a, a lot of progress and we think it's, it's as a result of our activities. Uh, and, uh, so, th so the defect rate is almost 90 percent but they've had fewer accidents? That's correct. Luck, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. English. Um, Mr. Miller? Write them up for me, so I can read them. Go ahead, Mr. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Fred Millar, and I'm the director of the Toxics Project at Friends of the Earth here in Washington. Um, we view the Sacramento spill as kind of a wake-up call, and I think I'd like to quote the mayor of Dunsmuir, uh, Virginia Barham, who said in the uh, San Jose Mercury News, she was quoted as saying, this time was tragic, but I want to know what do we do next time when it's something really toxic? Do we all die in our sleep? Now, given your clearly expressed interest in the kinds of information that are available to the federal government and to local communities, and also what Congress needs to do in order to uh, shape up uh, some of the, lacks, the gaps in information that we have, maybe I could focus on one theme from my written testimony, and that has to do with the availability to the communities of the worst case scenarios from the chemical shippers. The fact is we have, we have cargoes moving through our communities every day which could cause Bhopal kinds of disasters. Um, Mr. Roberts and I have testified before this committee before and at one point he said that even one ammonia tank truck under certain circumstances could cause a Bhopal kind of accident in a community. We have giant rail cargoes moving through many American cities that could cause Bhopal kinds of accidents. Let me tell you from my own experience on a local emergency planning committee here in Washington, D.C., it is extremely difficult for people at the local level to get information on what could happen. When we went to the two railroads that moved through Washington, D.C., namely CSX and Conrail, they at first refused to give us information on what was coming through Washington, and only after a year's worth of very long effort did we, did we finally succeed in prying that information out of them about what comes through. We still do not have information on what a worst case scenario would be. I don't know in what part of Washington you may live, but in the local emergency planning committee, we went to the Blue Plains Water Treatment Plant, which is across from National Airport. They bring in 90 ton chlorine tank cars right through Washington. We said, uh, we'd like to see your worst case scenario. The manager said, here it is. What it said, that document, is that in case of a worst case spill of a 90 ton chlorine tank car, you get about a 40 mile long toxic gas cloud over Washington. And 15% of the time, because of the wind direction, it would blow right over the White House and the Capitol. Um, I said that to an industry audience uh, a while back and one guy in the audience laughed and said, well at least those are acceptable losses. Um, Sweet. But Sweet. I pointed out that if the wind were blowing a slightly di different direction, it would blow over my house. Now there's nobody in Washington DC who, know, who knew that, that, there's, that there are these huge toxic gas cloud possibilities. I mean, the, 
the, when you call the White House and the Capitol and you say, are you prepared for an accident like this? Their response is, say what? All over the United States, people are in blissful ignorance of the kinds of terrible accidents that can happen. Now, one thing that I think we, need, we ought to focus on is who has got this information? It's the shippers of the chemicals. The giant companies that ship these chemicals are Dow and DuPont and Monsanto and so forth. They are not providing this information to the local communities through which they transport it. Uh, I must say that I have before asked the, in, the federal agencies if they would go to those companies and get that information and they refuse to do that. So we do not have information in the public sector about what is the worst case scenarios about the most dangerous cargoes traveling through our communities. That means people in, in local emergency response capabilities are just not prepared to deal with those kinds of accidents. And they're left at, at their own resources to deal with that. What we should be able to do once we get the worst case scenario information is to really look hard at questions about routing to avoid cities, for example. Um, FRA has done previous studies about the possibility of routing rail cargoes to avoid densely populated areas. And, it, and the conclusion of those studies was we should look at that on a city by city basis. In Washington, when we asked how much hazardous cargo came through Washington, the railroad told us thousands of shipments. The next year they told us they had rerouted half of those shipments to avoid the city. There are rerouting possibilities even for rail and even more rerouting possibilities for cities. So, let me conclude just by saying that we need to bring the transportation industry into the same emergency planning framework that the fixed chemical industry is. We need to, to uh, make sure the transportation industry communicates to local emergency planners what do they bring through, what can happen, and that the, uh, that the local communities are well informed then about what kind of training priorities they would have for their firefighters and what should they be doing at a state and local level about rewriting cargoes and so forth. Um, that is something that only Congress is going to do. The federal agencies under the current conditions and under their current political mandate are not about to go to the major chemical shippers and ask for uh, worst case scenarios. In conclusion, let me just say the companies are hiding out and the federal agencies are helping them hide out and Congress ought not to put up with it. Congress ought to force the federal agencies to collect that information and get it to the people who need it at the local and state level. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, because there's a vote, I want to end this hearing now. Uh, there are several questions Mr. Lagramercino asked. What I'm going to do is put them in the record and have you answer them, but I'm also going to ask if, this, if these witnesses would stay so Mr. Lagramercino's staff can meet with you to get answers to these specific questions, particularly the FRA. I think that they're very important questions. Let me just conclude this by saying, um, I held a, uh, a briefing in Sacramento in this hearing. I'm going to hold more hearings on this because we're far from completed. Uh, my views are very straightforward on this. I think the hazardous list, in other words, the list of materials that uh, RISPA is using is no good. It's incomplete. The obvious example of metamsodium is clear. The fact that I can get no assurances that it can be put on this list quickly, even on an interim basis, is an outrage. The fact that RISPA says it can't take another department of DOT in its own department, Coast Guard, and incorporate those uh, materials into their list is ridiculous and bureaucratic, and I don't accept it. Um, secondly, the containers aren't strong enough. That's very obvious. NTSB has said it for a long time. And we need to move beyond the gobbledygook and the two years of waiting and the rest to get stronger containers. Thirdly, the enforcement is weak. It's, it, it's, it's incredibly weak to hand a bunch of defects uh, over to SP and say, we trust you'll fix it and pay a fine and then get around later to collecting half the money and not even have a way of knowing that the defects have been taken care of is unacceptable and I'm encouraged that FRA is going to consider my suggestion that they require at least a sign off by the company so we know that they fix the problems with these locomotives particularly since it may well be that that it's these particular locomotives that may well have caused the problem we don't know that yet fourth the uh, record of equipment failure of Southern Pacific is completely shocking um, to have close to a 90% failure rate 
uh, is, 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 is absolutely unacceptable. And I think you add all of these four pieces of the puzzle together, and it says big trouble for our environment and for our people. And um, this is only the beginning of the subcommittee's work on this. I appreciate uh, the forthrightness of uh, several of the witnesses, particularly the FRA. I felt that they were forthcoming. And I, I can't thank you enough. And, uh, and we'll be working together to, to make this better. Uh, today, I'm sending letters forward to the various agencies with my recommendations uh, of what to do. They will deal with stronger cars. They will deal with better lists right away. They will deal with better enforcement. And uh, I hope we can move forward so the next time we get together, we can be moving together uh, toward a much safer system. This is never going to be foolproof. We know that we're human beings. We all make mistakes. But in my humble view, from what I know here today, both of these accidents, I believe, could have been prevented. Um, I believe that in my heart. And I think that means in the future we can do better. And I thank you all. That concludes Wednesday's hearing. And a note that the House of Representatives may take up the Surface Transportation Infrastructure Act Thursday when it meets at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. C-SPAN will, as usual, bring you live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the proceedings as members try to complete work on a number of actions before they leave for the August recess. Again, the House is in Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 7 a.m. Pacific Time. We'll take a break now for a look at the schedule. You're watching C-SPAN, a cable satellite public affairs network. We're taking a break now for information about our overnight...